I'm ready or to just uh, the hope is, Chief, that you can uh, get through your presentation in about, we've allotted you quite a bit of time. Oh. Uh, but if you can keep your presentation at like 15 minutes at most, so there's time for questions, that'd be great. I will be brief. You're on the clicker. Sure. Next slide, please. That's a nice picture, by the way. Yeah, that is is that a nice. recent one? It is. We did it in October. Um, we shut the street down and, you know. Well, there's no one at the library. That's amazing. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> hey, wow. Hey, the planning good. into it was... Um, Really yeah, it was uh, yeah. seven o'clock on a Sunday morning. And you have to do it before the sun gets too high, and really so. Nice. Yeah, get your whole. Yeah, we out. probably have um, maybe ten people, ten to twelve missing. Oh, because they were at the other. Or something, you know, out of town, and you, you know, you pick a date, and you just kind of. Nice, nice photo. Okay, uh, can you make it full screen? Yes, I can. Thank you. So the department's authorized for 83 personnel. We split those, um, about 76 of those work on, uh, are divided amongst three shifts and will work a rotating shift and there they staff the fire trucks at the five stations throughout the city. So we have, you know, three what we call engines or pumper trucks and two uh, ladders that have both a ladder on top plus a pump and then the tower has a bucket. It's basically another ladder truck that has a bucket on it two staffed ambulances, two in reserve that are, and, um, and then there's a one battalion chief who is basically the boss of the day. Um, five stations throughout the city. Our administrative division is three people, myself, Chief Collette, Deputy Chief Collette, and Deputy Chief Brown. Our training division has one person, and we put three people in the fire prevention division. Uh, last year, calendar year 2018, we ran about just over 8,000 calls for service. That was about a 3% increase from the previous year and about a 30% increase over the past 10 years. And uh, then you see the numbers. And many of those are, are small fires because, uh, again, we, with a quick response time, often those fires are unnoticed and don't, not un, unnewsworthy, thank, thank goodness. Our highest uh, demand continues to be medical incidents. And as you can see, about uh, 5,280 medical calls last year. This is the org chart. Uh, one correction to make the final, there actually should, the final, one of those, there's two shifts that have 18 and one has 19 as opposed to two having 19 and one having 18. But that's how we, um, that's how we kind of have our people spread about. Uh, Chief Clett has the majority of those and, uh, and Chief Brown kind of takes more of the administrative uh, operations of the department. Fire department budget is, as you probably saw very similarly last night to the police department, about, uh, we operate on about 4% of that budget is what we spend on operations. The rest are on salaries, benefits, keeping the lights on, the water, and power. So uh, we spend about 4% of that, or 400, about 400,000 on training and tools and equipment and gear and uh, those types of things. We had, a, we had a great year in FY19. We replaced uh, two more. We've taken delivery of two more new fire trucks, thank goodness to the bond. And uh, Chief Clett goes down on Sunday for the final inspection on the last new truck that was authorized under that, um, th that bond. And that truck will be here later, probably around Memorial Day, and then go into service after some training later in the month. We created a behavioral health program, peer support team. Uh, the impacts of stress on the fire service uh, nationwide has become an issue. We've had numerous uh, workers' comp claims, and we have a therapist on staff, and, and she, it's uh, pretty amazing the number of our members that go see her after either after dealing with traumatic events that they respond to or just uh, personal uh, problems in their personal lives, but she, uh, she has certainly made a difference in the organization. We implemented computer-aided dispatch, so basically what that allows us to do is send the right response to the right size emergency. So before we would send the same complement to a smoke detector activation in your single family home that we sent to the hospital, and now we, um, we define risks. So higher risk buildings get more people and smaller risk gets only one truck. And since implementation, we've reduced our unit movements by about 24%. Yeah, so they take up a life, 12 year life of a fire truck, that's probably million dollars, millions of dollars in uh, deferred maintenance or maintenance that we don't spend it on and fuel and tires and all that other stuff. Uh, we currently have um, three employees in paramedic school. That's about an 18 month program. This budget was able to support some people going to that. 
Uh, they are they will be testing uh, between September and January, and that will bring our number of paramedics to uh, an 11. We upgraded our defibrillator, so all of our units now have the same uh, same device on it, which they can send the information back to the hospital from the field. Um, these are top of the line uh, equipment, and we replaced about the other half of our portable radios. We issue portable radios as a really as a, pace, a piece of basic safety equipment, and um, and so that that we have um, we now every, everyone has a portable radio that is within. Uh, within a usable lifespan and kind of the last thing we're right in the middle of and very excited about is we're renovating station two where all our new recruits go uh, that that station currently or previously had one bathroom shower like a locker room so two showers two toilets but um was not gender neutral and we took that split it in half and we'll have um, when we're all done plus renovating a third bathroom three gender neutral bathrooms with showers in it so um well, as one of the ladies said to me the other day i'll be so happy not to um be using the bathroom and have a member knocking on the door wanting his toothbrush i thought that was uh that was she she, she did not she did not when she said it she just said it so innocently um, but it is very telling about uh the difference of that we in the fire service were a little bit behind on next slide please so the FY20 budget, as presented to you, will continue our current level of service, uh, continues to support our behavioral health program. It uh, fixes an, a mistake I made in FY19 on our overtime budget, and so it restores that funding. And it keeps our training for our specialty. So we had never really put any money away for specialty training, so those high risk, low frequency events. And uh, so it continues to help put some money into those events so that we can continue to train our people on those. Next slide. And that was primarily overtime, and only reason it's going to come in here. Uh, so what we did see challenges on, and is we and we and we will continue to see in the future, is uh, our building maintenance and repairs. We uh, this year has been a very tough year for our uh, building maintenance. We've um, we've experienced uh, two at least two boiler significant boiler issues um, resulting in a lot of a lot of money spent on repairs again it's just the some part of it is we have two stations that are one approaching 100 years and one exceeding 100 years old and and they have um that they require a lot of repairs and maintenance to upkeep um, we did make reductions on our training budget which this is for training not not the overtime for training that we were able to sustain and uh, and this is for outside classes and primarily um are trying to find and we we may still get there some dough to keep um at least one person in paramedic school for the going forward and then the final thing uh was we would hope to replace some of our fitness equipment and um which had been acquired in the early 2000s with a, a grant and um and we were we did reduce uh we did reduce that out of the fy 20 request Last slide, I think, I think this is the last one, um, really as it goes back to deferred maintenance in our stations. Uh, the I keep wondering when the window in Aaron's office is gonna fall out onto the street. Um, yeah, they are, uh, the the windows in our buildings, is, oh, the, many things at this old station, at, central, at the Central Fire Station are just getting tired. And, uh, and we, we know that it's only a matter of time before we have to deal with that. And I think that you, as you, we had brought to you before, um, the FY21 budget will uh, we will have that consideration of staffing a third ambulance in the new, new North End. I think I've that's the last slide, and I've done my best to get through in a lightning pace. Great, Chief. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, related to that bathroom improvement. Sorry to be sitting behind here, for a moment, but. Um, can you just update the council on how we're doing in terms of the number of uh, women on the on firefighters? Or Sure. So we currently have uh, four on staff, four females on staff. We, when I started, we, we had uh, we had one. Uh, we hired two last year and one this year. Um, and I think some part of that is the way in which now every re every recruit goes through or every applicant that's found 
Um, we have a two panel interview and a chief, the chief officers interview our candidates now at the final stage and make this selection as opposed to before um, it was a ranking at a peer, peer level. Um, and I think ultimately that probably has some degree of helping with the change, but we do have a, a four, uh, four women on the department currently. So we've talked about it. just last year this find an interesting issue. We, you know, we had just yeah, one, one woman on the department um, just several years ago, which isn't really out of line with uh, national statistics. You know, two, three percent of the department is not uncommon, but uh, we had noticed that uh, communities, progressive communities like Burlington that were proactive about uh, diversity efforts uh, did much better, 15% uh, or so in uh, Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, I think, in San Francisco. So it, it has been a goal, and, and it's appreciate the chief has been able to make, make some progress uh, uh, on that, and I think that about this investment is consistent with that. So. And it does, it does, to the mayor's point, it changes the dynamic in the firehouse. So it is, um, it is a very positive change in the firehouse that I, I don't think I appreciated earlier in my career, but as I see, um, you know, you see the st station where there's eight people assigned, and as you can imagine, um, having, a, having a, a female in that mix is a, is a really good thing. So with that, floor is over for questions. Councilor Busher. So, um I'm retired, so I get to watch stuff on TV more than I did before. And Channel 3, um, the morning show, did a whole report on a woman fire chief, I think, um, down in the D.C. area, and um, just talking about the, the challenges of, of having women get, first of all, employed in a fire department and then actually being able to move up the ranks and um, just just the real issues with gender and where traditionally there was either all women or all men in, in jobs and now when you mix that up how how different it makes it and and um, and challenging too because we're not really there but this is really good and I'm glad to hear that um, this question has to do with the fire department but it also it's probably either for Beth or the mayor. Somewhere in your overall budget re presentation, I can't put my fingers on it, you, you talked about establishing a reserve, um, uh, like a maintenance reserve. reserve. So, um, you know, when, when I hear de departments talk about their, their housing, their building, um, I, I'm conflicted as to, I, I feel like the city should be maintaining the structures that house departments and programs more than the, and, and that shouldn't really be a, that shouldn't deter or take funding away from their primary mission. And so I, you know, I, I get worried about hearing these themes over and over again. It's conversations we're having fleets a similar conversation, right? Departments that have been able to budget it get what they want. Departments that don't, don't necessarily get what they want. Or if something big happens, they're, they're left stuck. Problem is, m the majority of our properties have deferred maintenance, right? So it's a big ask. Yeah. So we can't fix it all at once. Right. We could do a better job of prioritizing the more um, serious needs first. I think it should be pointed out, we made it, yeah. Massive investments in the firehouses in recent years, way well beyond what had been done in a long time. So across built, yeah, I'd say in a lot of our buildings too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but definitely facilities. Um, is facilities in general was a small part of the sustainable infrastructure bond. I think the next bond that is done, and there will be a need for another bond, and we plan for one. Talk about one when we talk, had our debt. Um, debt ceiling, debt cap uh, discussions, you know, I, I think, you know, it's a couple of years out still, but in 20, 2022 probably, there will be a need for another bond and we can afford it within those sort of constraints we laid out. I think facilities will need to be a larger uh, component of that than they uh, were of, of this past one. It's not, it's not a criticism, it's just a reality. And as I, as I see budgets and I hear, you know, challenges or things, um, just trying to figure out how we can how we can deal with that. Um, so, but currently, 
for example, if if a department like the like right now the fire department had these two boiler issues, where where does that money come from? It's a mix. Um, some departments will be able to incorporate that. We do have a bit of a contingency or emergency reserve in the capital budget, but we don't have the funds to, to take care of the ground. So it comes from their budget. It can so, be their budget, or it can. Yes, yeah, so in, in this case, uh, one of them came out of capital, and one will, one came out of our operating budget. So it is exactly what Beth said. We split it. Okay. Okay. Um, the last question, I think you answered. You know, you in the beginning you talked about how many calls, and then you said thirty-five structure fires, and then fifty-two hundred medical. So that doesn't add up to. <coughs> 8,000, <coughs> so the rest of the, the difference were small fires that really aren't reportable, or what? You'll have it in your commission report, uh, broken down by every subject, which, which you should have very shortly. So there, there, are a, there are a litany of, there's like 10 categories everything falls into. I just captured the two yeah. okay. that I thought, yeah, I, I captured just two of them, or three of them. Okay. Well, I don't have any other questions. I think it's very good. Thank you. You're welcome. So one thing I wanted to ask about, like, should have probably asked the police this as well last night, is around planning and training around mass, mass casualty and, and sort of big crisis events and how this budget supports that kind of work? So we do a lot of that training on shift, but you know, we just led a, um, Aaron, do you want to speak to the, RT, the RTS? Yeah, 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 so what we did is uh, we took it out of our operating budget and just prioritized the different priorities. We trained the department and made purchases for special equipment, including tactical vests, the bulletproof vests, and helmets. We purchased enough uh, to staff the majority of the on duty staff with that across the city, so each staff piece has those capability. We did that in conjunction with PD, so it was kind of a crawl, walk, run uh, scenario where we started with tabletop what ifs, and then we put that into practice with uh, our law enforcement partners where we actually drilled on location and worked through, worked the entire department through that exercise uh, into the point where we actually, uh, the culminating event was a full scale exercise out at the airport. So we hired folks back and exercised the entire uh, event over a season, several months that it took us to get there. Um, yeah, so there is a capability. I think we probably led the charge in the county. I was fire EMS, and a lot of folks would jump on board, not only in the county, but across the state with our money. It was a great partnership with the police department for our people, too. It really, you know, it was eye opening on our end, and then, uh, and so it's just, it's sad that that's become the, um, where our culture is today. But yesterday, um, a firefighter in Appleton, Wisconsin, which is not a city much uh, different than Burlington, was shot and killed at a, at a medical call that just turned bad, that turned into something else. And, and so, um, yeah, I think that's, <laughs> unfortunate reality of today. Okay. And can you give an update in, in terms of where we are with regional dispatch? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, st we're, we hired a, so the kind of the next phase was uh, to hire a consultant to basically tackle all, what's, how many people do we need? Um, what should their shift be? How should the transition work? That we received the first two phases of that report, the third phase, and probably the most, the toughest phase, which is what's the staffing going to look like, what's the shift schedule is going to look like, is going to be delivered next Monday. We expect to be back to you um, in the fall with a recommendation on what the next steps are. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. And those, those will be momentous steps. So that will be like, are we doing this? Yes. This is like go, no, go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then if it's a go, Well, I shared about that, but it's this is not going to drag on forever. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So really, you'll get the no-go decision, and then we'll be off to the races. Okay. Any other questions for Chief Block? Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Chief. Right on time. Yeah. Have a great day. All right. Early. 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 Hold me to it. 
We'll give it to Mary Danko, right? <laughs> yes. Trying to plan it back for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, understood. Understood. <laughs> Counselors, thanks for uh, having us to talk about our general fund uh, budget for DPW. With me, I have uh, Lee Perry, who's the interim assistant director for uh, maintenance, and we also have Nikki Blow with us, who's our uh, maintenance, man or excuse me, our safety manager. Um, here we go with our mission statement, departmental goals. Uh, we also, just FYI, expanded on last year's uh, campaign for women in the works to do veterans in the works this year to uh, highlight all the veterans in our team next uh, we manage a number of different budgets in four main areas what we're presenting to you tonight is the seven million uh, general fund budget uh, we also will be coming uh, next week to talk about water and traffic and parking uh, but uh, later tonight you will hear about our 42 million dollars citywide capital projects budget. Uh, we have four divisions and 125 staff, as you see here. And uh, there's been a, a few changes here in our leadership. Um, so Jeff Paget is our interim assistant director for uh, parking and traffic, and Lee Perry, as I just introduced, for maintenance. You'll see the blue areas are the areas that we'll be discussing in tonight's budget presentation. I won't go through this, but uh, the breadth of the assets that we maintain 24 service on is extensive, and I'm happy to talk about any of those later. So what are our high-level budget goals? Click it through for me, Rich. The first one is to deliver on our sustainable infrastructure plan. You all know this. The council approved in 2016 a very ambitious recommitment into the reinvestment of all of our assets in the city. Uh, our ongoing work to do that uh, is significant. Uh, we also are very uh, pleased to say that not only will we finish the St. Paul Great Streets project out your window here, but uh, we are projected to begin the Champlain Parkway construction in FY20. Uh, it could be as uh, early as late this fall or uh, spring of 2020. Uh, coordinating the 645 Pine Street redesign, mm -hmm. this is to accommodate permit reform. And I have to say the partnership with Code and Parks uh, and the zoning staff coming down has really been great, and we're excited to bring that renovation of the building to fruition. Uh, this is our third year of Plan BTV Walk Bike Work Plan, uh, and so we have enhanced painting and new bike lanes planned. Uh, the Consolidated Collection Study. I'm wearing my recycling tie today. After 20 years of running the city's recycling program, we want to study with the uh, coming of organics collection, uh, how best to organize and collect solid waste in the region. We've been working with Max Tracy, the chair of the TUC, and we'll be bringing some policy options for you all in FY20 about whether we uh, get out of the recycling business. Uh, we are working to transition from a reactive mode in our uh, fleet maintenance division into a proactive mode. and. Uh, we talked a little bit ago about the uh, mayor's and administration's commitment to replace eight of our sidewalk tractors, which will be a, a help in this direction, but we're also structuring our work differently to get away from reactive repairs towards proactive. Uh, reduce injuries. This is it has to be a focus of ours. Uh, our injury rate has been above average and too high for our industry. Uh, we were very pleased that the administration and the council supported uh, having a general fund safety manager. Nikki is working with parks, DPW, and other general fund departments. Uh, and we've already seen a significant uh, progress this year that we'll talk a little later, but we need to do more. Uh, working with the clerk treasurer's office on project accounting, uh, there are countless capital projects all running concurrently through the city, and we want to improve how we manage those projects to ensure fiscal responsibility. Uh, and last but not least, our asset management program. Uh, we have been doing a better job of replacing capital assets, but in order to get the full lifespan out of those assets, we need to maintain them uh, better. And so an asset management program to do that is one of our priorities. We have a proposed new staff position of, to uh, help with this that would be funded out of CIP. Next. Uh, this is uh, a blunt picture of what uh, January 21st looked like uh, this year in our equipment maintenance shop. You'll count five tractors, all in various states of disrepair during a snowstorm. So half of our fleet was uh, incapacitated during a snowstorm, which delivers a uh, poor level of service. So 
uh, that's uh, a key piece of us getting to a more proactive state with managing fleet. Getting to the numbers, so here you will see FY16 through FY20, uh, the third to last column on the right is the FY20 budget with inspection service division, which is not how the budget in your packet is shown, but we wanted to give you an apples to apples comparison as if the building permits uh, inspection service division was still in public works. The last column on the right is what it looks like without the inspection services division. So an apples to apples comparison over the last five years, you'll see our revenues increased 20% and our expenses increased 2%. All right, key drivers. What's causing the changes in FY20? Uh, we touched on the first one. Is a big one, the loss of permit revenue. Uh, we're transferring both the income and expense over to the new permitting and inspections division. Uh, we're continuing to be able to do more engineering work, more billable work, uh, about half million dollars of additional revenue earned over the last five years. Um, so on street maintenance, uh, the conversation that Lee and I and Rob Green had before Rob's departure, We've had a hard time hitting our goals for sidewalk construction, uh, stormwater work. Uh, Lee's team is a billable team. And so when they get taken away by reactive work, uh, it, it takes away from our billable work. And so after four years of been unable to hit our budget uh, target here, we have proposed uh, reducing this revenue target by 145000 to a revenue line we believe we can hit. Uh, and then uh, lastly, there are a couple uh, items that we are proposing to fund out of fund balance. Uh, one is the co consolidated collection study we talked about earlier and uh, some of the safety initiatives that Nikki is overseeing. Next. So on the expense side, uh, you'll see there's uh, increased tip fee for recycling uh, through CSWD that's factored into this budget. Uh, the consolidated collection study, as you see here as well, uh, we've talked about this additional safety funds, the asset management coordinator. Uh, we are reviewing several key job descriptions and determining whether reclassifications are necessary. There are some placeholders in the budget for that. Uh, and a number of our program budgets uh, have seen modest decreases or modest increases this coming year. Next. So how are we responding to past surpluses? Um, we have continually since FY16, which you've seen as we've become less of a draw on the general fund. We have been more aggressive on revenues in a number of areas and tighter on expenses. Uh, that last check mark, we are now accounting to have $110,000 of staff transitions or attrition over the course of the year uh, from people moving on or retiring and us having a gap between hirings. Uh, we still have that $250,000 reserve fund. Uh, we've had it now for four years. We have not had to tap it. We're actually working right now to avoid tapping it this year, though fuel prices have increased, thanks to Lee and Claude's good work to find money in other uh, budget lines. And then uh, lastly, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in another way, we've pooled general fund fleet funds from police, fire, DPW to lump them into one budget so that we can make decisions that are best for the fleet overall and not which department has money left over. All right, so how we set up for FY21 uh, and beyond, uh, we are continued to focus our efforts on the sustainable infrastructure plan. Uh, we have reinvested in staff and systems to deliver a higher level of capital reinvestment than we traditionally have. So that is a durable benefit for years to come. Uh, we are exploring taking the next step forward with fleet and looking at do we centralize the fleet. Currently we maintain the fleet uh, through DPW, but schools maintains their fleet separately and decisions about which vehicles are replaced when uh, should we be making that decision uh, in a more uh, unified fashion across the city? And then lastly, with asset management, a key item of asset management is that you have the software tool to be able to document all the work that's been done and the maintenance and preventive maintenance schedule for that work. So take a sewer pipe in the city. 
When was it last inspected? What's it made out of? What's its outer diameter? Has it historically had capacity issues or uh, problematic inspections? We do not have one asset management system to help us track uh, the myriad of assets the city has. There are a number of asset classes that do have uh, computerized management systems, but often they are separate and do not enable cross-departmental or cross-division coordination. Next. All right, so finishing up, uh, one of the things that I'm very proud of in our department is that we play well with others to achieve the larger city goals. And you'll see them here, I won't read through, but the list of projects to have us work together as a whole, whether it's having a door and video system that is consistent across the city, thanks to our capital improvement program manager, Martha Keenan, we don't end up having a myriad of different systems, but one system to manage citywide. Uh, we're pleased to continue to do this work and look forward to answering any questions. Great. And I did that in 10 minutes. Impressive. It's noted. <laughs> um, questions? Council Busher. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Chapin. Yeah. Um, for this presentation, my packet, which I picked up and did not look on the computer, was void of the written word, so I just had your line by line budget. Yep. Yep. So I plucked out a few things by doing that. But okay. anyways, um, so um, first of all, by looking just at your line by line budget, I was really happy to see that there was an increase in monies dedicated to drainage and catch basin work. Yes. That seemed like a big deal, and thank you so much, whoever put that or got that money there. Um, I had another question, I think it's on that same page, which there is, there was some funding um, under, and I always have difficulty, it's under recycling, but under special supplies, uh, is that additional money for toters? Yes. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I am just taking a look here. So this the is question is then if this money isn't for toters, do we did we put some money in the budget because the intent is to expand that program and ultimately have everyone who in the city who wants a toter to have a toter for recycling? And I know there's a a problem. Well, there was a problem with if we had some, where would we store them? Um, and then I wasn't quite sure, I, I don't think I could regurgitate for everybody um, how we approached investment properties and how we got people, how we rolled that out. But it's something that, you know, it's been, it's been on our agenda for quite a while and I just want to make sure that the budget reflects those, yes. that increase. So just, just to be clear, and I think Councilor Tracy wants to say a few things, special supplies is for uh, expanded toter program. It is. Uh, okay. The tip fees are in the professional consultant services contractual. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. What, what, was there something else in that? That, uh, that uh, as that I. Is the toters. Yeah. Okay. In, yes. Okay. Um, the other thing I just wanted to comment. Can I just Jumping on toters, toters real quick. Sure. I just so is that we were told that it would be a quadrupling of the budget for toters. Is that did that end up at Took we had that conversation and when that was reported, is that did that actually happen here? Have, so uh, in uh, yes, in well it's a quadrupling from what was originally budgeted in the twenty nineteen budget. We had twelve thousand. Uh, then we were able to increase it to 25 in the amended budget for 2019. Now we're going to 50,000 in this year. So yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but the uh, the last thing I was going to say had to do with um, um, I I really support um, <clears throat> the city looking at the question of how do we maintain who maintains the fleet? How do we maintain the fleet? Does everybody? Um, have their own fleet and then you service it occasionally or um, but I just wanted to do a reality check Tim Ash was a city councilor when Tim and I went to the school department and tried to we did work on purchasing now but we also because I had heard this that you know they were maintaining their own um, 
vehicles. And so I think that, you know, the climate's changed significantly. And so I'm really hoping that um, there needs, I think it could save the city money. And the schools have, are tight with their money. And so if we can all benefit, I, I would hope that we could move forward with that. Yeah, please. So um, you may recall we actually had some outside consultants come in and do an analysis of our fleet practices. Schools took part in that analysis. Oh, they actually. did? Yep, yeah. they did. Okay. Um, so we got some recommendations back from the consultants. They didn't find as much savings as we would have hoped, but definitely I think it had some good recommendations for us that the team is working to impact. We will also look at doing funding. Um, we the, the school consolidation was not as significant as we would have hoped. We were talking tens of thousands in savings, which is not insignificant. The challenge is, is their demands on time and turnaround are different from our availability. So we have we, we, we would need to get comfortable with some of those concerns before we committed. But we are there. We're they're still actively involved in the project and looking at it. Well, I, I'm, my point is that it's been a conversation that has kind of, it began a long time ago. There was no appetite, but then purchasing got reborn, and there was appetite. We've saved money, and I'm hoping in this initiative there could be an opportunity. I mean, it, it, if it's not big bucks, so be it. But if it's some bucks, I care about it. As long yeah. as we can meet their needs, right? right. We, don't, right. we don't want to save $10,000 and not get, you know, right. not get their needs. So we just exactly. want to be thoughtful okay. about it. Thank you. Thanks. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, I would say the collaboration with the school district is as good as it's been in the seven years that I can speak to you directly. Uh, the <clears throat> high school work has us uh, in pretty regular communication around those issues, and um, we are trying to get. Um, I know we're working on uh, having another one of those uh, joint dinners soon with the district, and one of the topics on there was going to be just where we are in some of these shared services discussions. So, um, uh, uh, yeah. So just uh, after a period, you know, when they really didn't have the capacity for much coordination, um, that that's improved. So. Um, all right. Oh, Councilor Jersey. Uh, so one of the things that I feel like we're hearing consistently and continuously with regards to DPW is and you're sort of on the front lines of both combating and experiencing changes to changes related to climate change whether it's in water and the storm events that we're seeing whether it's in the impacts on streets and things like that or even in the context of this conversation around centralization of vehicles I feel like your department plays a pretty significant role in both combating it potentially, um, but then also responding to it. And on the combating side, I'm wondering um, if in the context of the conversation around centralization of vehicles as well as tractors, if there's an ability or an emphasis on addressing the vehicle miles traveled piece, because that is consistent, that's been one of the areas in the climate action plan where we've fallen behind. If you look at the metrics on like the city vehicles, we haven't really been able to meet our carbon reduction goals. So I'm wondering, does centralization help with that? And then do the do our vehicles that we're purchasing potentially under this, the, this budget, do they respond to some of these needs to really reduce our carbon? And then how also, and this may relate to other budgets, water and capital, but how specifically is this budget responsive to some of the, the challenges that we're seeing uh, in terms of responding to climate change at the local level. Right, great, Councilor Tracy. Uh, uh, I would say that Martha and Lee here and Claude uh, and many others are very much as part of the fleet analysis that uh, we have done has had an eye towards how do we move the city fleet to more efficient vehicles. A number of the vehicles that are recommended to be purchased in 19 and 20 are hybrids uh, and we are evaluating when we look to acquire new vehicles is do we have one available can we share better currently the administrative cars now at parks and dpw are shared across departments so you'll see a dpw employee driving a parks car and vice versa so we are trying to both right size the fleet make the fleet more efficient uh, to deliver on some of those goals uh, in terms of vehicle miles traveled i don't know if uh, we haven't thought about making the city any smaller 
Um, and I don't know in terms of, uh, we do have a city bike program to kind of help city employees make trips by a bike if, uh, if that is possible. Um, as it relates to some, uh, some reduction, right? I think that's the traffic, isn't it? Probably. Yeah. Council's recently given the green light to this north, this Letty refueling station, which Correct. will actually, I mean, it'll be, you know, won't be a large amount, but I actually think yep. there'll be some benefit, particularly during storms, in terms of plows uh, having to come all the way back to the south end to refuel. They'll, you won't, they'll reduce that trip. They'll probably spend replaced with more miles on the on the sidewalks but that's a good thing probably right um right but this this fleet this fleet thing is a big deal and you know we have been doing this fleet work and uh, you, i think you're aware we have this out these professional consultants advising us i mean we are it's actively implementing some of the recommendations of that and not fully feeling like that the whole kind of going forward fleet management plan is, is fully baked and Beth has committed to me that by the by the FY 21 cycle it, we will have a, a fully baked um, fleet plan with with a theory about electric you know strategic electrification of it over time we've been reading plans other cities have put together Minneapolis had a impressive electrification plan and uh, uh, I'm, I'm a convert to the operational benefits um, vehicles as well and I just think there are you know there are these secondary benefits of less less maintenance and and uh, quieter machines and and uh, so it, this know that this is a, a, a significant internal commitment to, to continue this conversation and I think we'll be in, have more to talk about this time next year and so the second part of the question so how it how is this responsive to some of the challenges that we're seeing so like the combating but how what about the challenges like the right the yep. freeze thaw cycle the yep. the, so, the storm events those kinds of things exactly so uh you will see in this budget a uh, renewed focus on stormwater uh reinvestment as council pusher noted uh that is in part uh, as we have ramped up on our pipe relining there's also the catch basin repair to be able to make sure that strong storm events don't erode the road or other infrastructure and that uh, our catch basins and collection system are robust. Um, we also have, uh, we understand as we have the last two years, there's been significant winter deterioration and we've had to pivot our paving uh, schedule and cycle uh, based on uh, the eruptions that we've seen due to the freeze thaw cycle. We understand that is gonna be more of a commonplace in years to come. And, understand that our program may need to shift mid-year once we see what uh, what is falling apart and what needs more urgent attention. This year we've added 12 road segments to our paving list that weren't on the paving list uh, that the council and commission saw this fall. So those would be some quick answers. I can just add that we're also trying to do more test pitting of the road to identify the existing sub-base condition. A lot of these roads were built way back when where yeah. base didn't really exist or just well and so it, it's it's cost prohibitive for us to do a full depth replacement so we have to be strategic about how we invest in that regard because obviously with high <coughs> volume streets with commercial traffic those are the areas where we need to focus our attention on doing something like that where where it's appropriate and necessary and can meet within our means but the budgets aren't really built for full depth redevelopment and that that means that the roadway surface doesn't have as long a life cycle as we would hope but our predictive models are, are hopefully eventually because we've been doing it for a while are ar arriving at a known replacement cycle that kind of stays on top of it as opposed to reacting to it and I think with a significant capital investment I think we're getting closer but we still have significant work to do and as much as we've gained in the reinvestment the climate has made it that much more of a challenge for us so it's I think another thing that's a positive is that we are, um, the reinvestment in some of the underground infrastructure means that we have less breaks, we have less utility cuts. When you have less utility cuts on the roadway, you have less um, potential for water penetration and frost and those sort of failures. So every little bit helps, but it, it takes a significant amount of time and money. <laughs> so we're, we're making progress, but there's still more, plenty more to do. Thanks. Okay.
That's and great. then, well, oh, sorry. I have a little more. So on the the staff on the staffing side of things, there were two areas where I feel like um, we had there were some er some some challenges. One was in, on the engineering, and that was sort of addressed in I think the last budget where we added some staff uh, to that. And I'm wondering how that's really helped to move you know throughput and workflow issues because I remember just hearing from constituents who would put in like for instance a traffic calming request, and we'd be like, all right, get in the line, you know. Yeah. So how is that helping with that? And then also, I know that there's a the safety position, and I'm wondering, is that responsive to some of the issues we saw with OSHA and stuff like that? And is that really designed to address and prevent those from being an issue in the future? Thank you, yes and yes. Okay. Uh, so I'll let Norm uh, finish up here, but uh, on the engineering front. So traffic requests get submitted uh, routinely from residents who are looking for uh, attention in that area. Uh, three years ago, we had 99 uh, requests that were reported to the commission in queue. Right now, we're down to 31. So uh, if you look across the board, we are able to be more responsive. I will tell you that there are certain programs where there's still a line. Traffic calming is one of them. Uh, but uh, we are uh, able to be much more responsive with our current uh, piece. And then on safety, uh, yes, uh, the culture of safety uh, needs to be our major priority and we've launched a campaign we've got a safety committee that meets monthly we just have our stats together uh, that we're presenting to BTV stat and we've seen already marked improvement in our injury rate and our lost time injuries that we're really excited about but we're not there yet so we've made the right moves in the directions that we want but we're, we're still uh, over the industry benchmark just add that um, we've had a, a greater depth of bench as it relates to traffic requests and that traditionally you had one person doing that work working closely with me now we've restructured our team where we actually have two people kind of skilled in that area so that they can swap out each other kind of do other things and I think that's been a strength um, I also think that um, we've had a considerable amount of kind of reinvestment in our streets to support multimodalism which uh, Nicole and Elizabeth did a great job on the front end of the planning and process, but then we have to kind of connect them with civil resources, civil design resources, engineers, to build these things beyond just a quick build. How do we build it in a permanent way? And Olivia has been a, 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 a pretty strong support in that area that they've traditionally not had. In other words, they've been, Elizabeth and Nicole have been kind of doing their own design with some support, but not much support. And so it, it gives a little more depth of bench and more of a balance of team to kind of arrive at a better solution and better product at the end, a more durable product. So I think there's a lot of good things about that. And um, yeah. I don't know if there's any, much more to add than that, but we, the staff was really kind of built up to deal with all this new capital work. And when you hire staff, they have to be trained, they have to be skilled in the, the work that we do. And so we've slowly kind of, they've grown and developed. I think we're now starting to kind of meet that peak in this, you know, start of the fourth year of a five-year capital plan. But there's, there's still, we're still kind of loaded up and with work with the staff we have. So there's not a lot of space with the staff that we have, but we are really starting to kind of get in the swing of this capital plan and getting a lot done. Thank you. When I started here, our capital budget was $13 million a year. This year's is 42. <laughs> yeah, so Enough <laughs> said. <laughs> Chief, can I add to the safety portion of it? Yeah. Um, so uh, though we've made progress, there's still a lot of work to do um, just for staffing reasons. Uh, Lee's group, uh, the streets department, uh, is down to 11 employees because of injuries right now. So they're doing all that work with half the staff that they're expected to use. So they're really doing an awesome job just to just to get everything done. And I want to recognize the fact that they are working hard to stay safe. But unfortunately, sometimes those accidents happen. And as far as like the OSHA visits and stuff, um, they have had a couple on-site inspections that they've passed recently that went really well, and they got good praise from OSHA. So it was really nice to see that they're doing well. Yeah, right away is our contractor for many things, but we supplement that with private contractors as well and that's they do a considerable amount of work and do a, a good job 
and really offset the city's general fund obligations by taking account the money and keeping it in house. So. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, um, Chapin. You still report to us next week on which one, which things next week? Uh, so parking, traffic, and water. Okay. So questions about uh, parking enforcement. That should be under what well, that should be next week next and week. about uh water that'll next be next week next week okay so and I parking have, enforcement you should ask the police as well as they do the enforcement work uh we set the regulations okay. whoops i'll be just till okay. you're ready yep. i'll be asking Happy. about the hours of enforcement and the potential rolling it back further yep. um one uh one thing that you do have here is um on the implementation of the third year of the plan BTV walk bike work plan. Um, how many new bike lanes are scheduled for this year uh, and how many parking spaces will be given up if they're all implemented? Sure. Um, so for this year, calendar year 2019, which is part of FY20 and part of FY19, uh, we are looking at uh, two major areas, Flynn Avenue and Colchester Avenue, both which were discussed at the commission meeting last night. Uh, the commission acted on a small part of Flynn Avenue, uh, but we'll be coming back next month to discuss most of Flynn Avenue and Colchester Avenue. I thought that was one that was canceled last night. Uh, was... Colchester Avenue was delayed uh, and... I mean, canceled the, the meeting, I meant, in terms of... No, the meeting was... Not the meeting, but the, the issue itself. Oh, yes. Uh, we did information items to just to give uh, the commissioners uh, updates for Colchester Ave. No decision was made there. In Flynn Ave, we only made a decision where there was strong uh, public uh, support for an alternative. The more complex one, uh, which has a more divided constituency, has not been acted on. Which so is. If they're implemented fully, it'd be a loss of how many parking spaces? Uh, I don't have the number offhand. Uh, we've been asked on Colchester Avenue to expand the area we're looking at beyond what we were originally looking at. Uh, so uh, we're I talking dozens ask, of spaces. Asked by who? Uh, we were asked by a city councilor and a number of residents to expand the scope of the Colchester Ave review. Okay. So to give uh, time for our public engagement process to play out, uh, which is that plan that you all suggested that we make sure we talk with homeowners and prop, uh, residents that we want to do initial mailing communication uh, with those stakeholders. And people are all notified when there's potential loss of parking in an area, all the neighbors. Uh, yeah, the public engagement plan says if more than three spaces are going to be impacted on a street that we must uh, contact the property owners and the, uh, and the uh, occupants. And one more question. Um, our I've had this said to me, so I want to ask this accurate. People, I've had people say to me that when they ask about it, that they're told the council passed this plan, it has to be implemented now. They're, that is not accurate. Okay. A plan is a plan. In each phase, uh, we bring, we need to bring to the commission for their approval. There was a lot of discussion last night uh, from a number of folks who said, why does the Public Works Commission have to approve each step here? We passed a plan. We want to see quicker movement. And we explained that what the city council has delegated to the commission is that the commission regulates uh, parking and, and traffic on the rights of way. And as a result, uh, each change requires deliberation, engagement, and decision. So uh, there, we do not come, it is one consideration that if the plan recommends something that we recognize in a recommendation, our staff recommendation, that it is consistent with plans. It is not the only consideration when we're deciding whether or not to recommend something. And frankly, our last recommendation on Flynn Avenue was short of the plan VTV walk bike plan and a number of advocates yelled and screamed last night that why didn't we just recommend what the plan said. I'm more concerned about the people that have to deal with it than just the advocates. So, okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, can I just ask one follow-up question? Of course. Um, I didn't, street sweeping. Yes. What do you budget for? How frequently do you sweep the streets? Because I'm well aware of the the springtime sweep yes. 
Yeah. But then I don't think there's. M I I know that that I hear that there are other times, but that you're it's not as disruptive to people, and you don't move cars, and when you're spending money and improving catch basins and all, I'm hoping that you have money in the budget that you could actually maybe clean the sweep the streets a couple of times at least in um, during during the non-snow season. <laughs> I don't know what. Right. That that was you know, like March, I mean May 14th it snowed, I know, in some places. But anyways, right. but I is that is there money in the budget to allow you to do that or not? There is. We have two sweepers. Yeah. Lee, why don't you talk about our two sweepers. Um, again, it comes down to assets and staffing. Like Nikki pointed out, we're down to uh, you know, 11, 11 employees that can actually do the, the physical work. We have some of the restrictions and some that are just out. So with those 11 guys, we have to build the sidewalks, sweep the roads, rebuild catch basins, pave all the potholes, all the other work you see going on. We do have an employee that works um, Sunday through Thursday, and on Sundays he, he goes around, sweeps the surrounding area. It usually starts here in the hub and, and works his way out and sweeps his eight hour day. Um, we will post roads during the week, especially some of the roads that might have gotten missed where cars didn't get towed during clean sweeps. We'll post them the following day and he'll go out and sweep those areas. Would like to get a, a, a sweeper out more regularly, especially in the fall, you know, with the leaves coming down. Mm -hmm. um, keeps, like you said, keeps the, uh, the infrastructure and basins clean. I just see, I just see this consistent with um, catch basins and trying to make them effective and uh, so that's it. I and don't it's need a water to, quality just, issue. You mentioned that uh, next week with the water presentation, and you will get full-throated support from Megan. We are trying to get more sweeping done. It also benefits the lake by having less organic matter yeah, be I'm, discharged. I'm well aware of, of yeah. what I'm asking for because I really think it's needed. I think yeah. it's it's all rolled into what makes yeah. our our lake and our water better and our streets safer. So thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Okay, I think we're going to let uh, DPW go. Thank you, Chibi. Great oh, yep. job. Well, we'll and be back here in a little bit. Yep. Uh, thank you for now. Um, so, Fletcher Free Library is next. Welcome, Mary. <coughs> so, Mary, we're trying to keep a few minutes for counselor yep. questions, if you can try to keep it to about seven minutes or so. Sure. You're up. Yep. Um, it's a pretty stable budget. I think it's important to remember that um, it wasn't a few, just a few years ago that we've added uh, quite a few positions. I did bring some strategic plans. I, some of you already have them, but um, we're still um, going through that. Um, so it, it's very stable. Um, you can keep going. These are just some pictures. As you know, everybody, I hope everybody knows what the library does. Um, but one thing that we continue to do is, is expand our programming. We have outside folks that use our space. We have a chess club going on. We had Grow with Google come this year. We had a Harry Potter party. Our programming has just been really flourishing in all our departments. Um, this is, again, a big part of the strategic plan. The, it's important that we're still following that. Um, the mission, vision, our strategies. We're actually right now getting ready to refresh and take a look at it. So you'll be seeing coming out in Front Porch Forum uh, and um, our email newsletter uh, a survey to look at, again, how are we doing with our strategic plan? Um, what kind of feedback um, can we get? Uh, for some of you that don't know, the library consists of many little departments, and it's very jargony field that we're in. Um, we've got administration, circulation, reference, adult services, youth services, teen services, a funny word, technical services, which is where we do all our processing of materials, and custodial and maintenance. And this is our organizational chart. Um, this was a, a, a big thing that happened in um, May, but it went into effect in October. We did, we were able to do a big reorganization thanks to the hard work um, with HR and the mayor's office and the board of finance. And we've had four 
big retirements in the last year, um, a 40-year retirement, 26 years, 25 years. Um, but all those, when those happens, those are when those happen, those are great opportunities for us to look at the organization and restructure. And as you know, libraries are continually changing, and not only are we order, offering physical items, but now we're offering more digital items, and so we're always trying to be reactive to that as well. Our budget overview is the same as it's been for the past couple years. The majority of our budget is uh, personnel. Uh, the next part of our budget is the, the overhead it is to run the building. Utilities, um, equipment fees, maintenance fees. There's been a lot of great work um, with um, clerk treasurer's office and working on the copier um, programs. Um, we work with um, uh, DPW on uh, our maintenance contracts and things like that and we're always looking for ways to collaborate save costs and look at energy savings too we work quite closely with Martha we're actually meeting with her once a month now we have a 46,000 square foot building um, one of them one of part of it was built in 1904 and one part was built in 1980 um, so we're always um, looking at ways to do that the, we're very fortunate the majority of um, our collection is all covered by a half cent tax um, that is a real gift that this library has, and we are very grateful for it. And we use that money to, to purchase all the things for the library. Um, we're very lucky because we have a 501c3 nonprofit that supports the library, the Friends of the Fletcher Free Library. We've spent the last few years building their capacity. They take in revenue through book sales. Um, uh, we have a stall, they've been selling music CDs, and we've been adding events as well. So they bring in a lot of money and then, go ahead Rich, they um, give it to us to spend. And so every year I go to them, I ask for an allocation and we spend it on all kinds of programming, professional development, um, and they also do things for the community. They make sure that books get to other community areas as well. We. We have um, volunteers for the friends that come in every day and work on um, book sorting and book sales. So it's, it's, it's a really great um, supporting agency. And all, I would say, most public libraries, if not all, now function with a public-private split. So we've got really great support um, from the public, from the um, city taxes, through the, you know, the city. And then we get a lot of support from the friends as well. And so the goals are really just to keep moving through this strategic plan. As I mentioned, we're looking at it again. We're refreshing. Um, we are look, starting to think about a feasibility study for what we can do to the interior. There's some things that we think we could do with space planning to make it work better. Um, we, our key performance indicators have always been and will probably always will be how many people are coming to the library, how many people are borrowing things, and how many people have library cards. We continue to look at that. Um, we're increasing our outreach into um, infants, youth, tweens. Uh, we're starting a 1,000 books before kindergarten program that, that we're very excited. We have a lot of grant funding for that. And we're continuing, we're piloting, piloting an early literacy outreach program as well. We're like I said, it's a pretty stable budget, so what we like to do is try and think what can we um, do more with less, and one of the things we try and do is look at efficiencies. We get a lot of support from the I city IT department to use the intranet. We use that a lot to help with our internal um, processes that we do. Um, the other thing we keep doing is expanding programming. Again, that's for help from, with help from the friends, and um, working on ensuring equity um, and welcoming cultures to all, for everyone, for the library. We like to think that we're, you know, it's free, open access to everyone, but the more that we can do with outreach and making sure that we're welcoming is really important. The other thing we're doing is we're, we're trying to look at any barriers that people have for the library, and one of the things is fines. So we've been gradually bringing in new programs to help people um, reduce their fines. So we have Amnesty Week. Um, for youth, they can read away their fines. They can come to the library and read and get their fines reduced. And we've started a volunteer away your fines. So if people have fines, they can come in and um, volunteer a little bit at the library and get their fines erased. <clears throat> Not very many big changes. Um, we've Our attrition uh, line went down a little bit, so we're glad about that. Personnel costs have gone up, as, as you've probably heard already in different um, 
budget presentations. We're asking a little bit more for security because um, we're getting ready to put an RFP out for that. We're anticipating that there'll be uh, a, a price increase um, and maybe we can get a couple more hours. And capital leases, um, I believe, was a savings this year. Yeah. And that's it. That's a summary of that. We're always, you know, like I said, 80. 81% is salary, so that's the biggest thing we're always looking at. Um, building maintenance and, um, you know, our collection we're always looking at too, as I mentioned earlier. There's more online services that we're offering, offering and that's a more volatile market for us, um, but our print circulation is, is going up as well. And that's it. That's so this was good. Um, I have a couple of questions. One you touched upon with um, what is a really good program of, of um, allowing people to um, work out, work off their fines. But, and there is, this is not a big ticket item in your budget, but um, under uh, fines it's $28,000. And I wasn't, I wondered if that would be realized now with the, with a lot of people probably seizing the moment to not have to pay. Um, so I, I'm, I, I don't think that will be the end of the world, but if, you, if that's not realized, but I just put that in as a question mark. Mm -hmm. uh, do you agree that that might be less than that as far as, as revenue, a source of revenue? It could be, but what I like to think is that the goodwill goes up so much that our donations increase. I see. So, and I will say across the nation we are seeing larger libraries do away with fines entirely. So I think, I believe it's San Francisco is one, and so it, it, again a lot of communities are looking that, looking that as a barrier. So the hope is that we'll um, step into less fines, but trying to find ways to replace it is a good point. Other questions. One is, um, you mentioned the half penny, and that was a city councilor from long ago who actually um, put that forward. And uh, there was a whole debate about splinter taxes, and there was this whole controversy. But it did pass the council and get on the ballot, and people certainly did. People were worried that we would no longer get people donating money because now there was a guaranteed source and some and some of that was realized that people backed away from donating but anyways I'm glad that half penny is there also um, but are there any as you've looked are there any other new sources of revenue that are available to libraries that you can think of no, I think what we're really trying to do is do it with the, through the friends. So we've had the jazz brunch. We've had our second jazz brunch, was a, which is an event. So they used to only do book sales. And now we're trying to get them to do more events, to do fundraisers, and to try and get income through that entity. And is that pretty successful? It's getting better, yes. So I think this year they, they definitely made more than last year. And they've increased the amount of book sales that they do, too. Good. Um, you mentioned the um, the additional dollars for s security guards. I thought maybe that meant that you would, I don't know how many hours there's a security guard present. I don't think it's for all the hours you're open. Am I right or wrong? Is Correct, it's uh, Saturday and Sunday it's full time and then Monday through Friday they start in the afternoon to till close. Okay. Um, do you see that as, as a problem? Do you feel like that you'd need to potentially, ideally, would you want a security guard there all the all the hours you're open or not? Right now we're okay. okay. Right now we're okay. Okay. Um, the last thing is, um, you mentioned all these new nuances, but I didn't really see anything that was directed towards. It, it, they were listed as seniors, but I didn't really see anything in your outreach that was targeted to either senior centers or. Um, senior housing, um, you know, and can you just speak to that? Is there, are there programs? Yes, so we have an outreach librarian and half of her time is going to the senior centers okay. and we just added a new one and I forget what it is, but I can get back to you with a list of the places that she goes to. Well, I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't just on the wish list, but it was actually, it was realized. Yep, yeah. and I would say we're expanding that too. We, um, 
she's actually been trained trained to help people get the talk <coughs> book program which is a federal um, program that people can listen to books on um, through the through an audio player that they have and so she's been expanding that as well so I can get do would you like me a list of the places she goes to That's okay, okay. The, the thing that I wanted to say is that with the City Council you know with everything being so busy and so bigger than life all of the issues um, one of the things that we've let go of or changed the format is for our annual reports and so oftentimes they're on consent a few of them are presented to the council directly but in the past the library presentation was a very satisfying and it really it, it just made you feel good about the library and the community and I miss that because I mean some of what I asked would have been in that kind of interaction mm -hmm. um, and I'm sorry that we don't have that opportunity um, the other piece of it is that it was on channel 17 so people could understand what each department did better um, with these written reports, they certainly can read them, but it's not the same as someone doing that presentation. And I think the library is, is one area that everybody values and would like to know more, a little more about the services. So anyways, thank you. Appreciate it. Any further questions for Mary? Great. Great job, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, welcome. I think Eileen. I think you're up next. Are we on track? Uh, I think yeah. we're doing quite well, actually. So we, we actually picked up. Uh, we are precisely on track. <laughs> to the minute. <laughs> welcome, Eileen. Certainly can. So rather than a, a PowerPoint presentation, because our budget is fairly simple, uh, I thought it would be just as well to go through the budget itself here. I started a PowerPoint and I said, I, I don't have a lot to say that isn't just duplicating what's already up there. So um, uh, just I w thought I would highlight for you what uh, there is in our budget. You'll recall that we have uh, six attorneys in the city attorney's office, one paralegal, one executive secretary, Bob Rustin is a part-time policy and compliance specialist. And the big change that we're looking at for this um, coming fiscal year is adding a, a, a new position that we're still working on exactly what we'll call it, a records officer or a records uh, specialist. But one of the primary things that the assistant city attorneys have come forward to me to say is that they need the, the, whoever is handling public records is doing a lot of administrative work and it isn't a good use of attorney time so we need and we think we probably only need someone part-time and the problem is the work kind of goes in um, waves up and down um, in, in the last month or so um, Joy Hovestad who started and who has taken over that position has been spending virtually all her time on public records requests because they're just she's had five and six at a time without a break every time she responds she's we've she's been getting a new one but prior to that we ha would have a month with virtually no public records requests so what at the same time the city has gone through and, and Beth can help me um, talk about this a little bit has gone had hired a consultant to look at overall records um, in the city and how to do record storage and retention and destruction and kind of all the issues around records and so we're thinking that this person would probably do both the the administrative piece of the public records responses that needs to be done in our office and assist in the implementation of the consultants recommendations and looking at record storage um, through the next year we see the position as a limited service position um, to see how it works out uh, and what it does and whether how far the person gets on the on the consultants recommendations so that's the big thing in my budget and you will see it in the expense line 31 salaries and wages um, seasonal I mean sorry in line 29 part-time um, um, and that is um, the addition of of that person and I, I think and I think um, I think we have Bob's in the in the temporary category down the 60,000 um, 
did you say Bob is the seasonal temporary? I believe that's right. Bob is the part-time, actually. Oh, the other way? So yeah. Bob's the part-time, and the seasonal temporary is this new person? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, all right. Um, Thanks, Beth. Thank you. Okay. You will see that we have a fairly large reduction in our full-time salaries, and that's um, between the um, retirement of Jean Bergman and um, Anthea was also at a significantly higher level of experience than um, uh, Joy Havistad, our recent hire. So we've had turnover that's let us reduce that, that full-time. I think also that um, there was some part of Bob's salary that was in there that got pulled out down to the lower line. Um, um, so that that really is the big item in in our budget. Um, with everything else, where you see some increases are generally salaries and benefit increases that occur through bargaining and in, and people's longevity and increasing in their salaries. We did move. We also have some increases under our books and dues and subscriptions. You'll see there's um, increases there, and that's again generally the costs of, of those materials over time and that we have um, a, f a few, we, for example, we have a contract with Westlaw which is um, up for renewal. We're going to be bringing it to you and we're looking at potentially adding um, some services to what we get from, from them and that will be coming to you. Um, other than that, we're, we tried to fairly level fund um, most of the rest of the budget. So those are the, the big items. Um, just usually when I do this review, I review with you that we use a number of outside legal firms as well. Um, in FY 2018, we used um, 10 different firms for different specialty from our insurance company, uh, pays, um, paid Downs Rackland Martin to <coughs> do some insurance defense, paid Lynn Lynn Blackman and Manitsky to do some insurance defense. So that didn't come out of the general fund. BED uses um, specific counsel, uh, Bill Ellis at McNeil, um, McNeil, what's their firm, Letty and Sheehan, <laughs> and, and um, um, we have used uh, Jeremy Farkas at um, um, uh, Murphy, Sullivan, and Cronk for doing a lot of our real estate work because he's a real estate specialist. Uh, Primer Piper, Eggleston and Kramer represented the city in the BT sale. We have a firm down in Washington, D.C. that helps us with FAA matters on, on the airport um, that they regularly work with us. Uh, I also, in 2018, we had um, Amber Tebow, who used to be a BT employee, is a, now an attorney and works for a law firm, and she did a lot of the operational con contractual work for BT during the, the, uh, the fiscal year. Um, Dunkel Saunders does environmental work for us because that tends to be a little bit of a specialty that we don't have in-house. Again, most of Dunkel Saunders is paid through a combination of federal and state and, and a little bit of city money on big projects like the Champlain Parkway. So those are what we do with outside counsel. In terms of this next year, besides the focus on getting more efficient about com um, complex public records requests and following up on the records storage, uh, consultant recommendations. I hope to to come to you with um, a request for qualifications to try to really review our use of outside counsel and and take a look at that and make sure that we are getting the best rates and 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 the most qualified people um, because we haven't done that for a little while. Um, I also so that maybe I can broaden the legal panel a little bit, like who we choose from to do certain things. Um, I also am hoping that I'm going to get to establish um, a, a standard retainer agreement and, and, and some rates. We've, we've more been focusing on getting people to do specific specialties than we have really standardizing that, and that's, it's just a piece that's never been done. We also have a number of ordinances to update the, and that are coming to the ordinance committee, such as trespasses, special events. Uh, we're going to be needing to review the planning and permitting. Uh, ordinances as the new department gets started, um, and then there, there are a few others like that. Most of what we do is provide support services for various departments, providing legal support and answers to, and the attorneys, each of the attorneys in, the, in our office other than me, has departments assigned to them that they work regularly with. 
And that is, um, we continue to look for efficiencies, particularly in the use of outside counsel, and, and that's one of the reasons I want to look at this RFQ process for going forward is to see if we can get some efficiencies and savings further in that, uh, in that area. And that's really my presentation. I just have one quick question. It might be for Beth. Um, the on um, on the budget worksheet um, for forty seven twenty use of fund balance. Yes. Yes. So that's on the list of fund balance. So that's where we're using. We it's a request to use unassigned fund balance both to continue Bob. We've been using fund balance for Bob's position as a temporary. Um, and then the additional is use of fund balance to kind of do a trial for a year or two with this um, part of this <coughs> position that Eileen talked about that would be the public records and the record usage. So, so we need to fund those two so positions. So that's what that money is being utilized for. Thank you. I just wanted to better Sorry. understand how that was being utilized. Okay. Good question. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. Great. Nothing else? Well, let's you go, Eileen. Thank you. Um, Great, we picked up uh, five minutes. Great. Um, <laughs> sorry. Cindy, welcome. Parks and Rec. Great to be here. So first I want to tell uh, Dylene, Justin is amazing. He's our attorney that we use, and it's really pretty um, amazing to be able to just, you know, email, call, text it, you know, for Justin if we have any questions. So thanks for being so supportive of Yeah. So don't lose them. Treat them nice. <laughs> 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 There you go. All right. So um, general fund budget presentation will be following up with a Capital One following DBW's Capital. So focusing here on general fund. Um, so basically, we work really hard, our department does, to be fiscally responsible for the city. We spend a lot of money, but we brought, also bring in a fair, fair amount of money. Um, if you want to just go to the next slide there. So leading you through our org charts, I think most folks know what this is, but just a reminder how our department is split out. Um, this is our leadership team. So Derek Roach um, oversees the Parks Division. Nina Safavi um, as our Parks Comprehensive Planner, the Planning. Gary Rogers, um, Recreation Superintendent for the Recreation. Melissa Cates, our Recreation Facilities Manager. And Aaron Moreau is our Waterfront Superintendent and Harbor Master. So that's kind of an overview of our department and the various divisions within them. So planning team, so Nina oversees um, three staff there. We have two project managers and our marketing um, person. Next is Parks. Parks is a huge division. This is really a big one, and it comprises multiple levels. So VJ um, oversees our trees with four um, arborist technicians. We got facilities with Todd Greeno, who will be uh, 36 years with the city this month, and he has 15 um, employees under them. And many of those are custodians that you'll see often in um, our city buildings. Grounds, um, that's a, our grounds manager position is open and we're currently advertising. If anybody knows somebody that might be interested in that, we're really looking for someone who can take that grounds division to a new level. Um, that's the person responsible for all the playgrounds in our city, plus just a lot of mowing and trimming. So we're really looking um, for somebody there. And we have a lot of long-term employees there. Richie um, Snow's been there and Chuck. They're really long-term city employees and um, Chuck is actually out right now. So that division, um, is four individuals, our grounds division, that's responsible for all the mowing and trimming and all of our parks, and it's cut in half at this moment. So um, be patient with us if you think something is maybe a little bit longer in the edge around the grasses, but we're working hard with seasonals to try to keep up. Uh, conservation, they are small but mighty. That is uh, Dan Cahill, and really trying to build up that team. That's something that I know um, Jesse tried to get start, started that and got it going strong. And we are really maintaining that. And so again, Dan does not have um, a full team there. He's got one person under him. And then we also have Megan, who reports to me, but she also does a lot of work um, with Dan as far as the community garden program. And then last one within parks is cemetery. And they have two and a half employees. And the nice thing about that half employee is that it's a full-time employee because Beth and I share a position. So Holly works for us at the cemetery, and then she reports down to the CT office. And I think, at least from my perspective, it's worked really well. Um, it's allowed us to get a more, um, like a theoretically a higher quality employee by being able to offer full-time. And we play well in the sandbox together, too. Uh, next is recreation, that's Gary Rogers, and he's got seven different staff that are underneath him, um, from athletics to seniors, rec programs. They, they say they, they create a lot of fun in our community. 
I'm gonna do the next one is Waterfront. So that's Aram Row, and that's basically, um, this is our huge revenue generator for us. So, and Erin is fantastic in that she really runs it as a business. So she really thinks of this in a, as a business model, um, running our campground in our marina. Um, and then we also have our um, external events. So uh, Richard Bailey, who does all the external events, happening, I would go underneath there for you, but um, <laughs> does all our external events. Uh, he is also in the waterfront division. So that's battery and down there can you and then our last org chart there is um, recreation facilities so that's a Melissa Kate she's another long-term city employee and she oversees the Miller Community Center and Letty Arena and the piece to note about the Miller Community Center is that's where our main number rings so that's really our main sort of um, customer service is happening at the Miller Center all right so the next one is our top three to five fiscal changes um, so uh, basically, we're trying to see what we can, what monies we can find within our division. So, we had thirty-five thousand dollars predicted savings in electricity. Um, a lot of that at uh, Letty Arena, and that really helps us because we had twenty-five thousand dollars increase in our trash, and it's really hard to do much about that. You know, with some things you can, you know, try to save money here or there, run a little efficiently, but, you know, people put trash in trash containers, and so that that, uh, that has gone up. Part of that is contamination with recycling. We are increasing, um, it might seem small and significant, $5,000, but it means a lot to a lot of people. So we've added um, some money for portalettes um, at Schmanska, Apple Tree, Smalley, and Ethan Allen Park, and that was based on community requests where we didn't have portalettes in those parks. Um, and I know that there's also been a resolution that was, the resolution was brought after we had um, added this money in, and so we're putting a report together for council for with Jordan does, where are all the bathrooms in the city? So um, these ones will be, so we theoretically potentially could be more, but that's where we are right now with additional portalettes. Um, we're adding a senior services program. So that's not new money that we're adding that senior services program at this point. We just pulled um, the senior program, Champlain Senior Center is still gonna be under recreation, but it was under the Old North End Community Center line, which is 249. And so we pulled it out of there and put it into its own 244, just as we have athletics and special events separated out within the recreation division, we decided we should pull senior services out of there as a separate um, division too. And I know um, there's, I think it's a potentially already up on board docs that there's a task force that I'll be bringing to council um, about Heinerberg, but um, so that. And then the last one there is we are, we added $36,000 to the waterfront seasonal staffing. So uh, we needed a really better staff Oak Ledge. And it sounds like from what I understand over the years that really nobody wanted to be responsible for the staffing at Oak Ledge. Um, it's just kind of a little bit out of the way. And uh, so we said, basically said, okay, so whoever gets the money gets to do the staffing there. And so the money was in waterfront um, as far as parking and the shelters. But it makes the most sense for, to be for waterfront to staff Oak Ledge. That's what they do. They work with seasonal staffing that's with the campground, with the marina. So they do it, They not only do they do it, but they do it well. And so we really think that we'll see a nice change at Oak Ledge with um, groups that are coming to our shelters. There, there won't be times where they get there and somebody else is there, or maybe there's some trash under the shelter. We just don't see that that's gonna happen this year. And then the other one is they'll be really diligent about the parking. Um, sometimes people think that nobody's paying um, for their parking, but I think anyone that looks at our revenue line for parking, people are paying to park. Um, so hope, but anyway, and that's where a lot of that money is covered from is uh, parking revenue. All right, so we look kind of at our, um, we're always going back to our system themes. And Nina Safavi is our first comprehensive planner is here. Nina has done a really great job of always reminding us to go back to our master plan because a master plan was, came about from community input. So we could look at, think about looking at our budget from that and our staffing, what they're gonna focus on based on these system themes. So you can go ahead to the next one, Rich. And there's the rest of them. And then we're just gonna jump into, I'm gonna focus on three, you can keep going. So we're gonna th um, focus on like our, what our staffing priorities are, which relates to our budget based on our system theme. So the first one there is people. And let me kind of catch up my notes because I don't have this memorized. All right, so the first one is people. So the way that we can really focus our, um, you can go to the next one, please. Mm -hmm. um, the way we focus on people is um, by recognizing culture, community, and partnership. So we work a lot with different partners that allows us to do more. Uh, we are actively involved with the Burlington Wellways Coalition. We've been working with BCA and Fletcher Free Library on its uh, additional summer camping. 
um, for this year for the, in August. And then we started partnering also with City and Lake Semester. That's been out of our Old North End Community Center. So just examples of some partnerships we're working on. Volunteers is a major part of what we um, helps us with, with the capacity of what we can do. And again, that's just community. People being able to give up their time helps them feel a part of the community. So not only does it enhance what we do, but it also gives people a way to give back. And we're expanding our rec nutrition program this year. We got a grant from NRPA and the Walmart Foundation that's allowing us to expand that. And we'll be working more multi-gen um, with our seniors and the youth. And one wouldn't think portalettes would relate to people, but it does because that allows the community to feel good about coming into our parks. And that's especially families with young children and our seniors, they need to feel safe that when they come to a park, if they wanna go for a walk, that there's a place to go to the bathroom. And go ahead and the next one. Wellness, um, achieving that through our increased scholarship funding, um, we've been able to uh, increase that in two ways. One of them is by staff looking to see with their lines of like where have they consistently been bringing in additional revenue that they haven't really acknowledged it in the budget. And so one of those was athletics. Over time, athletics has been bringing additional revenue in, but we haven't really reflected in the budget. So that was one of the ways that we were able to increase our scholarship funding by was by that revenue we're bringing in other places can help us with scholarship. And then also the Pomerlo uh, Foundation has been fantastic. They have helped us with the Christmas, um, the soon say Christmas, the holiday party, um, and then now they've made an annual contribution that's um, split between BCA and um, Rec. So that's another way that we've been able to increase the amount of money that we're able to give out to the community, because we realized through our work that we did last summer in. Uh, looking at our demographics a little bit more, is that we've got some disparity when it comes down to our fee-based program. So increasing our scholarship really helps to make it so that kids can take, anyone can take part in our fee-based programs. Uh, prioritizing outdoor recreation experiences. We helped with the cross-country ski, ski grooming at the Intervale. Hopefully we'll have another winter like we had this year, except for it comes later and it leaves earlier. Um, but it's beautiful snow in the middle and we can continue to do that cross-country skiing. And another one with our rec nutrition, um, as far as wellness, um, if kids are hungry, it's, help, it's hard for them to have good wellness in the summer, and we are adding another summer meal site. And the last one, as far as our themes, and I, is stewardship, and I brought you guys a little present. You can pass these around. This is our new mascot, B. Oh, There's all your little B sticker, because that's part of our stewardship look, is uh, we're not like focusing in on, we're a B City USA. And we had a very nice looking bee at our kids day. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so green infrastructure management plan, that's something that we're going to be developing over the course of the year um, as far as protecting and preserving our environment. It's important that we're able to do that. And so we're working on that plan um, in close collaboration with DPW. Um, continuing our plantings at Oak Ledge. Um, if you see the press release today that talks about that strong program that we have. And then the e-bikes that are being purchased by the Waterfront Division is just another way that we're um, helping with the stewardship because with the e-bikes, it gets some more emissions off our bike path and trucks having to go around the city just to go from Oak Ledge to um, the marina. They can take the e-bike and go back and forth that way. So, so hopefully you'll see more of those out on the bike path this year. Addressing previous year's surplus, I just want to say that we really look carefully at our budget because that's the way we really can grow our budget is um, Beth, you know, challenged us in a really, really good way, which was to say, hey, if you want to grow your budget, look at it. You know, your guys are having some surplus every year. So rather than having the surplus that, you know, is, goes to, in some ways, a surplus goes to, a, you know, it goes into the, um, uh, what, hit the what is the fund? Balance. Fund balance, because once the money goes into the fund balance, it's not really, not that it's ever mine, because we're, it's not our department's. It goes into this fund balance and then it's split out into however that the administration determines is the best needs for that unassigned fund balance. Well, let's look at our budget. If we're consistently for athletics, for example, bringing in more revenue and we are trying to grow scholarship, well, let's grow scholarship. Let's be a little bit more, not to, I don't think the word is honest, but just being more realistic with our numbers. I found one in there that was a $3,000, which again doesn't seem like a lot of money, but it was something we'd been budgeting $3,000 for for like a number of years, and it must have made sense at one point, but we hadn't touched it in years. And so that's $3,000 I can use to something else, and we're not, you know, putting to the taxpayers money that we're not going to use. So, um, so it was great, and Beth's team was really supportive in helping me figure that, <laughs> work my way through the uh, the new budget process, which was um, was really really helpful. So thank you to your team for that help with that. And staffing changes, um, we do plan on bringing two limited service positions, um, two hopefully regular service. Um, they are hitting their three-year mark coming up this fiscal year, so we'll need to um, address that. 
And then the last uh, piece there is looking at FY21. Um, our website is one that we uh, do need to update. We had that on the list for FY20 last year. Um, so we're going to need to try to figure out some creative ways to try to um, fund updating that. Um, increasing park staff, that's something that's a little bit harder with the revenue end on that one, um, especially on the grounds. It's not like they bring in a lot of money. So how can we be creative to find some funding to help with that grounds division? But with the new grounds manager, we really hope that we can see you know, where it is we need the support, um, having a, a true manager in that position. Trees are looking at some pretty unique ideas for some additional revenue that we can find for trees. Um, and again, conservation programs, another one where they, um, with the revenue that they were bringing in, really realizing they're consistently bringing in more revenue than they thought for community gardens, and so that allowed that conservation program to grow a little bit. So we're trying to find ways, but these, the parks one is a little bit, little bit more challenging, so FY21 will be continuing to look at that. And not necessarily full-time staff, it may be just looking at seasonal staff there. And then also FY21, we've been working with planning and zoning, they're looking to be taking the lead on this one, is that waterfront and harbor master plan is something that we've been, uh, started the ball rolling and planning and zoning is looking to take the lead on that. That's it for me. Any questions? I hope you like your bees. And so B is our new mascot, and she is very cute. <laughs> Go ahead, Councilor Busher. Um, so thank you. This You're was, welcome. This was a lot. As, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, um, and I talk fast. Yes, you do talk fast. <laughs> That's good. Um, so, uh, so you are very creative, um, and you know we we spoke about our dedication to trying to increase scholarship. So what I saw in in a line item was uh, 7730 was that there was an increase of $10,000 for scholarships. Is that enough? Well, is we'll it ever enough or is, <laughs> but I mean, is that, is that? Well, we have the increase from 10,000, but we also have 12,500 that we, you know, so I'm, actually, I'm not sure if I actually reflected that one. I think about it, the increase from the Pamela, it's in a separate fund. Um, I don't think we did actually I don't think we did actually I'm realizing that one is one that came in um, that we'll need to actually so that's an I think believe an additional 10,000 because 2,500 we were going to use this year so it's actually going to be an additional 20,000 um, for so Parmelo gave an additional how many well he gave a total of $25,000 yes and it went it split half 50 50 of BCA and um, okay. Parks Rec Waterfront but we uh, we'll be spending 2,500 of it in FY19, okay. and so that'll be another 10,000. Now that we think about that, okay. we'll get so that you'll have an additional 20,000 20, for scholarship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's and good. It's, you know, it's pretty exciting. You know, thinking about who you know really working to direct. We're really working hard. A lot of the kids that are um, in our program, some of our licensed childcare. You know, some kids that they can go to licensed childcare because there's funding for it. Um, but they may never go to Lego camp, or they may you know, never have those opportunities. So we've been working on that, and Gary's been working with um, the United Way as far as some ideas on transportation, because that's a challenge too. Okay, so I had, um, so you, you touched upon this. You touched upon the fact that, um, well, you said people don't think that we get money from parking, but we do, because um, on a line item, it depends. One of them is waterfront, and I don't remember which line item. But anyways, it looked like you were there was anticipated another forty-seven thousand dollars. Is that the waterfront? Uh, probably, yeah. See, the, uh, yeah, I know and, our parking is. And do is you really think that that I mean is that is that because there are those new spaces or what is that because of? That's a lot of money. We're building a new parking lot. It's the new parking lot. That's what I thought. The new spaces. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure I was right on that one. Okay, so that seems reasonable. Um, I couldn't seem to find where the funding was for the Champlain Senior Center, the $40,000, the revenue source that comes from the city. Is is it in there or it not? It is, in two, it's in 244, so it's at the very beginning of the Recreation Revenue Division. Let me see okay. if I can, my pages are probably not the same as your as your pages. Okay, you but mentioned it. was a it. new, it's a new, um, so it's under inner fund transfer proceeds general fund okay that's forty thousand dollars in there and again that used to be under 249 for the old north end community center but we pulled in created a senior services division okay all right um and that's a constant that's still going to be there mr mayor yeah and we have another 18 somewhere else right this is the champlain not the uh 
Right. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. Sort of this is Champlain, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, if, I, if I wanted to understand how senior programs are funded now that they're under the, the old North End, I mean, you've got the $40,000, but they're under Parks and Rec. I'm, I'm having difficulty trying to understand that just to make sure that those programs like the, the meals, et cetera, I mean, you touch upon them, and it's really hard to pull programs together for me. So anyways, I'd just yeah. like to, and you don't need to do this tonight, but okay. I, I am interested to know how that, what that overall funding looks like for that. So if you, if that two, four, so it's 101, two, three, 101, dash 244 senior services right now that's all the money that we're using towards as part of our senior programming with the exception of obviously if someone shows up to a um, say an exercise class at the miller it's not that one's not under senior services it's but we don't we don't check ages at the door for those but that seniors i are you happy more, to help I was show more you more interested with what happened to the program at the multi-gen center oh, okay. and how that got rolled into that? this is what i'm trying to ascertain it's that new yes, organization yes exactly yeah. um and then my last question has to do with um so you met you touched upon the fact that you do you collaborate with with other departments like burlington city arts so is some of their funding is bca getting some funding from from parks and rec or how do, what what are we doing here i don't understand that no so if the, so their new partnership that we're working on this year that's um, going to be in august is a two week summer camp when most of the camp even like a lot of the uh, boys and girls club is closed we've typically been closed there's a lot less going on, so we're running, we're working with BCA and Fletcher Free Library to run a camp during those two weeks. Okay. And so we're not, they're supporting, they're gonna run some programming during it and we'll bring the kids there for that programming, but it's, there's no general fund money that's like say going to BCA to do that. It's, we'll be charging the kids, it'll be part of our licensed childcare program, so we'll be getting some revenue from the state to help with it too. And then you mentioned, I'm sorry, I lied. I had one other thing. You mentioned That's right. the trees. Yeah. Um, and so on Across the Fence today, our arborist was there talking about the ash borer and the fact that we haven't seen it, but what we're doing to be proactive. And he talked about sites in the city where, you know, a lot of, like, there are 100 yeah. ash trees. And, and we're planting trees now so that when the, tr the ash tree has to be removed, the other trees will grow up. Um, so we have that funding in place, or are you still looking for some of that revenue? Um, that'll come in um, under capital. Is most that they do okay. have a, they do have some money in the general fund, but, but, but most of it's it, in yeah. capital. Okay. We, right. You might, but, if you didn't see it, Councilor Bush, you might want to check out. We put out a whole press release uh, a month back on how basically we're planting many more trees with the same budget because of. No, I remember that, that, but I love the fact that yeah. that there he was on across the fence talking about this and, yeah. and yeah. our plan. He's, our let's plan. just say he set the bar for the grounds manager. It's like, okay, if we could get a VJ for a grounds manager, <laughs> like he just okay. is phenomenal. He's really and he, I mean efficiencies. I mean, he found three weeks, I think it was, for staff time by being more efficient with their time for getting that Burlington Electric contract done. So it came. It, it came. Across Across, no pun intended, across the fence, <laughs> but it, it, it was very effective. It was very clear. Oh, good. It was good. Anyways, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That, uh, just, uh, just one second, Councilor Just, just the, uh, we're excited. I, I'm excited. I think it's one of the more significant kind of shifts that's happened in the last couple of years is and it really kind of came out of the, the focus on equity through BTV staff, this collaboration with parks. BCA and the library, um, uh, this is sort of a new working group that's been working together s since we really started um, measuring, really digging into what kind of kids we were serving with, uh, with these programs. And, and it's led to innovations like this, this discovery that there was this underserved part of the summer that um, where we can serve, serve better. So we're, we're hoping this is going to continue. It's been exciting that that's been combined with this kind of almost organic uh, growth and uh, funding for scholarships. So I think it's really been an area of some progress over year to year here. Great. Councilor Tracy. So um, 
I wanted to ask about the Old North End Community Center mm -hmm. um, and some of the staffing issues there, and if you could just explain what's going on with the budget for that, and then now that we've got it more up and running, what you're what you're thinking about that? Because I think we, if I under, if I remember correctly, we had been staffing that at a, as a part time role. Yep, I can help you. That so, so, yeah. so I'm just wondering how that is because I, I had spoken, I had heard from a person who had been in that role before, mm -hmm. before that they felt like that was. Yeah. A, maybe not the best way to necessarily grow it and that they felt constrained and that that was part of the reason that they had left that role. And so I'm just wondering how you're thinking, how we can really best make use of this incredible new resource uh, in the Old North End and how this budget can, can really help drive that access there. Sure, so I wanna um, clarify one point. Um, so the Old North End Community Center has got a full-time site supervisor, that's Migmar, um, who's on site there full-time. He does custodial, but he also schedules the building. Um, provides and he's and it's one thing that's really helpful. Migmars he knows multiple languages, so when folks come onto the second floor to our space, and if they're trying to look for ALV, they're or they're trying to register for a program, it's really helpful to have a f uh, full time staff member who knows multiple languages to be able to help. Um, I think the position you're referring to is a teen program. Yeah, teen. Yeah, exactly. It's the teen yeah. program, and that's one where we have. Um, oh, a lot of the funding for that comes from ALV. And it's one where I, I feel like I still want to look at it a little bit more, just because you know I heard one of the staff members saying something about they're trying to try to pull numbers. They're trying you really to pull numbers into that program. You have to really pull them from existing programs. And I think, wait, is that really how we want to be doing it? Is that what we want to be doing? Is thinking about we're going to grow our teen center by pulling kids from other teen centers? So it's one that I would need to spend some time analyzing over this next year. We have a new person in that role um, who's been really excited and um, has been really enthusiastic um, with the kids and so we'll see how that fleshes out because I'm not sure we need right now I'm not convinced that we need this full-time person to run a teen center because if we're just pulling kids from existing programs is that really was there this need to do new so that's one again I just need to look at a little bit more and our recreation division um, Candace Holbrook who's our recreation manager and our three uh, recreation specialists also operate out of that building um, which just provides us more bodies um, on site um, with that program. One of those recreation specialists is focused completely on Champlain Senior Center. Okay, awesome. Thank yeah, you you're much. welcome. Right. Cindy, thanks. Yeah. Just a really quick question. Um, there are neighbors over at Curtis who are um, connecting with me and thinking that maybe that dog park is going to get moved or relocated. Can you tell me what is, is that realistic? We, we have no interest in, in moving that dog park at Star Farm Park. Um, basically, I think there's a lot of people that utilize it. You know, one of the things that we've been working on with that dog park is last year, the group came to pack, and some of their, their real interests were was trying to reduce the size of the dog park, so it's something we've been looking at. And we did a survey over the winter trying to find, looking at Star Farm as a whole, so not just the dog park, it was a chance to see what people thought about the park as a whole. And um, so we've been taking that information in, and then our uh, Max, one who's one of our project managers, has put together three design options um, for reducing the size sums. We're, we are interested in reducing it, it size sum. It sort of helps a little bit that they want to reduce a little bit. It's really big, and to fence that much is really expensive. So um, we'll be looking to bring to the June meeting the idea of reducing um, it's the idea of bringing it in, and then we're also looking at a concept around membership to Star Farm Dog Park. It's something with the renewed um, uh, vocalizing of concerns. We've been trying to think of, okay, what else could we do? It sounds like you know the noise is an issue. They're concerned about times. And so I did done some bit of research to see what other communities are doing. Um, and this membership model seems to be something that's you know working well in communities, and it's, it's not a low barrier for um, price, but you have to have your dog needs to be registered. Um, and we're hoping that that might help. And we have a new uh, site coordinator too. Thanks. So there's a, so there's some discussion at the next meeting about changes that will address the neighborhood neighbors' concerns. Yeah. Then that'll be the June 11th Park Commission meeting. Right. I'll try to attend that. I just I just I'm con I was getting concerned that some neighbors are getting I think misled into thinking that there's an effort going to be made to move the park and that it really might happen. I don't want them to think that that's, that's realistic gonna happen. yeah it's not gonna we'll happen. help to see what messaging we can help with that yeah no it's not coming from you so I know it's not coming from Thank me <laughs> Thank you. thanks you're welcome great are we done with Cindy 
Not so, done. Uh, I know uh, you're saying. Uh, well, they get me back again in 15 minutes. <laughs> um, great, Cindy. Thank you. You're Thanks, welcome. Cindy. Okay. We actually What's finished the comments. People need a do back to back. break or anything. We want to plow right into. Sorry. I just didn't, didn't, we've been going for two hours. Does anyone <laughs> want to break or should no. we just go right into the keep, no. keep going. We want to keep going. All right. So then we have uh, CIP capital budget is up. Welcome, Norm and Martha. I'll try not to break your mic. Is it the PowerPoint or the PDF? I know I'm a Which one up there? PowerPoint should be. This one right here. Beekeeper. This is? Yes? Beekeeper. Could be. Mine should be. could be. Capital projects, fiscal year 20 budget. I doubt it. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's budget. That's not the spreadsheet. That's not the PowerPoint. That's beautiful. I did put it in your email. It's in your email as well. I can't see that far, so I'm sorry to say I see that. Capital, DPW, I see a PDF. Was it posted in Board Docs? Yeah, just even if your email is open. It's a pleasure to see you all tonight while he's figuring that out. This is the fourth year of the sustainable infrastructure bond, and so. Um, in November of 2016. That was approved and uh, at that time, as Chapin mentioned, our budget was about $13 million for capital and it has incrementally go. gone up every year since then. So it went to 15 and then 21 and 30, 000, uh, 30 million in uh, fiscal year 19 and this year it's 42 million. So um, on it's been growing and with the aid of that bond that was approved by the voters in November of 2016. Um, and it covers all, you can go to the next page. <laughs> there you go. So it covers all general fund items. It does not touch water items. Um, and it has multiple funding sources, not just the bond. We, um, you can go to the next one, Rich, that's okay. <laughs> So we do, we are a collaborative team, basically. We work with all of the departments on multiple items. Um, and so uh, we are supporting things such as the fleet analysis, asset management, the uh, work that's been done on Memorial Auditorium, work on energy efficiency. We've been working on the UVM collaboration that relates to the University Heights um, uh, and university place work and from that agreement that was signed a year ago, I believe, um, with UVM. We work with parks on the bike path and other projects um, and the facilities and everything else. So we have multiple different areas that we're working with. Um, this just shows you uh, I, the actuals for 17, 18 and the projected for 19 and how they have grown. Um, and um, so it's a huge change and that's what we ramped up our resources for and also utilizing the on-call engineering consultants that we spoke of at Board, um, at board of Finance on Monday night. So all of those are helping us to accomplish these things and we still have a long ways to go. Um, just a couple of things, this is some of the work Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, you know, this is just talking about some of the things that we've accomplished. We've accomplished a lot in these um, three years, not only on paving and streets and water, but on um, renovating buildings, the fire trucks. Um, so we're really making a tremendous project. But as Chapin spoke to, we have roads that deteriorate from freeze and thaw in the winter and so we're, we keep on finding new challenges that face us. Um, go ahead. Lots of projects that we've, we've finished. Um, our projects basically go from $20,000 like the police department break room to $35 million Champlain Parkway. 
Um, and we are, yeah, you know, these are just more projects that we're working on and it, in conjunction with developers, with TIF. Um, and Norm, it's your turn. So I'm gonna take it, take it from here. We have, uh, so this is uh, the listing of goals in advancing the capital projects. Our goals are to provide balanced prioritization of how the city will reinvest based on basic principles, limiting risk and liability, cost avoidance, keeping facilities in service, and then timely capital reinvestment positions the city to make use of less costly maintenance solutions. Remain in good close communication with the public as we advance projects to limit the disruption that ultimately will provide them value in the future. And as you've seen, uh, the public is, is is wearing, their patients are wearing thin with some of the work that we're doing, but we have worked very hard to have a good means of communicating to them when things will happen, how things will happen, so that we limit that disruption. So the other, another piece of this puzzle is the be in close coordination and reinvestment of these systems to avoid rework or, or damage to those redeveloped systems. That comes into play when we talk about water resource underground being reinvested and uh, paving a street or doing sidewalk work. And uh, one key thing here is um, the city, is, as it grows and, it, learn, and it, it restructures its teams and its, its efforts to do the work, we're re reconfiguring facilities that match and align with those needs to be responsive to deliver the delivery of those city services. So, next slide. So this slide here represents the fiscal year 20 and reinvestment with the city will be investing in, in excess of $42 million in capital reinvestment for various, from various funding resources. 10.9 million will be from the sustainable infrastructure bond and the continuation of the general cap, fund capital borrowing of two million a year. And the balance of the 42 million comes with the various other sources, including institutional borrowing, street capital tax, penny for parks, impact fees, state grants, and the like. So there's a number of different sources beyond just one. Next slide. So, so some of the larger projects that require significant financial support include the continuation of the enhanced effort to reinvest in roadway surfacing and replacing of sidewalks, the reconfiguration of facilities to be more efficient and responsive delivery of services, which I mentioned earlier. The continued re reinvestment in the redevelopment of the bike path and the transition of the Champlain Parkway from engineering, permitting, and design phase to construction. And you'll see there's $13 million is right there that's largely all construction costs. So this, this slide represents the number of major capital products that, that continue from year to year, like roadway and sidewalk replacement, or those have been in development for a number of years, have yet to be realized. Example being City Hall Park. Next slide. So, continuing reinvestment major in our major public infrastructure facilities. From our experience, we're improving our planning and financial management processes. Our planning and financial decision making processes need to be flexible as we encounter changing conditions or unpredicted conditions. We have significantly improved the condition of our existing facilities. However, we have not arrived at a low cost preventive maintenance solution across the asset classes. So in other words, if, um, if things are in a state of severe deterioration, we have to do capital investment before we start doing minimal preventive maintenance repairs. And then the 10 year capital plan proposed a number of funding solutions, some of which did not materialize. We continue to remain committed. However, we have to be realistic in our ambitions and adjust accordingly. Next slide. So FY21, the fifth year of the five-year capital reinvestment, we advanced and completed a number of important capital projects at the, at the close of FY21. However, for FY21, it's anticipated to be less financial resources available than previous four years. City staff is beginning to shift our focus from accomplishing the five-year capital plan to more time and effort applied to planning the next generation of a five-year capital plan. The capital committee will be we're coming back in late summer, early fall to begin the public conversation with ideas of how to best move forward in the FY22 and beyond. So this slide is the, uh, is a, in the, in the planning process, these are projects that weren't identified or anticipated, but once, but once identified for reasons need to be a higher priority. Here's a list of projects that are not identified in the original 10 year capital plan. 
So last slide, beyond all the course details of each individual project, here's a slide of strategies the staff is applying to their daily work and we believe will lead to a successful capital program. And that's, and then there's 18 pages. And of then projects. there's, yes. And then all the individual projects. You, you can scroll through the slides if you'd like to. So that's the street capital program and the, the actual individual line items in the budget slide. Um, that's the street paving program in more detail. Pavement preservation, sidewalk contracts. You can see all these in the, the packet itself. Parkway. Parkway, I think, it, if you, I don't know if the parkway's yeah. in there. Yeah, it is in there. So the Parkway project, that what you'll see is a significant amount of reinvestment in investment in development of the project itself for construction, not necessarily for design. And we plan on hopefully arriving at a place where we're going to actually go to construction in December of 2019 this year. Of course, it's all contingent upon what kind of challenges we have legally with the project itself. But we are in a, in a very good state to move ahead, and we're confident that we will soon. That's probably a, I think that's a monumental um, thing for us. Questions? Great. Thank you, Norm um, and Martha. Um, a lot in this. Uh, where, where, are the, where are the questions? Go ahead, Councilor Tracy. So we made a lot of progress on sidewalks, and I think we're starting to see that cumulative impact. But... For some reason, I keep hearing from folks that they're frustrated about sidewalks, and I understand that we haven't we were we're playing catch up in a lot of ways. Yep. And so I'm wondering if now that we've done a lot of these larger stretches, if there's an ability to be more targeted uh, in that, and also if there's a way to maybe update some of that um, work that was done several years ago. Um, with regards to um, the citywide analysis of sidewalk condition um, to understand if the conditions have changed. Yes, so we actually had an internal staff meeting about how we try to begin to address those concerns and, and answer those questions. And I think one of the challenges that we, we face is that much of that short run work, the repair work to deal with isolated locations Traditionally, has been done by our, our street program, our staff within house. Um, with street, uh, the right of way program, busy with other work, they have limited ability for it to do more work or, or work in the near future because they're focusing on supporting stormwater and so on and so forth. And so then, who do we look for to be able to do that work? Well, we would look to a contractor to do that work. And what we're sensing is that because these are such short runs, there's a high mobilization cost. Contractors don't actually reside in our facility. They don't have equipment. They don't have people. They don't mobilize from our location. They mobilize from some remote location. <coughs> and we would be paying high dollar and delivering much less than if we were to do it ourselves. So unfortunately, we're kind of at a struggling point to decide how we can try to address those issues and still get good value to the public itself. And. Um, this late in the season, we could attempt to bid this this fall or possibly this spring work, but it really is where do we stand with financially where we are with what we've already got on our plate now, and can we turn it around quickly in the near term? I'm so there's a lot of a lot of things we're still working out, and I I don't remember all the details because frankly, I came late to the meeting. I was working on preparing these slides. And Chapin was there as well, but um, I think we'll, in the near term, we'll be preparing a communication that kind of frames all of these issues in the best way possible to respond to that concern. Okay. And then yeah. the second issue is somewhat related, but it has to do with more so the, the quick build. So we've embraced this idea of doing quick build projects, notably in the five corners in the south end and then the old, old north end greenway, and I think we've seen some success especially in the south end, but I think also in the, in the, on the, the greenway in terms of safety gains and, and beautification, those kinds of things, though 
the feedback, at least in the context of the Greenway, is not all great. And one of the criticisms that I hear is with regards to the planters and the bollards, and it looks cheap or it looks bad. Yep. So I guess what I'm wondering is within the capital budget, how are you seeing us transitioning from quick build strategies to more permanent um, uh, solutions to some of the safety issues that we're seeing or some of the, the challenges, and how does this budget sort of move us towards the... So I kind of alluded to earlier, one of the things that we're attempting to do within the engineering team is is uh, have more of a comprehensive team that moves something from a planning function to a actual built situation. So quick builds were, were really kind of quickly assembled through public process with Nicole and Elizabeth with very little civil support because at the time there really wasn't many staff within the team who could support their efforts. And um, so when we reorganized and we actually added a few engineers to the process, we are dedicating someone to that pur purpose. And Olivia is uh, an engineer within our team who's actually doing some of those designs and, and looking to construct some of these things. For example, North Ave and Berry Street. We're uh, looking at a more formalized engineering design as opposed to um, some of the quick builds that Nicole and Elizabeth have tried to put together. And, Nicole and Elizabeth have also done a lot of the public process and procurement, but it's not enough to have their work bring it to the next stage, which is really to a formalized construction process. And we've actually signed a con uh, consultant contract to engineer right. uh, the permanent uh, curbing at Five Corners. Uh, so w the goal of Quick Builds is to move them, tweak them, does it figure out what the uh, best design is and then make them permanent. So we have that design underway. We also have the design underway for the right turn lane on Battery Street approaching Pearl Street uh, that was closed last year to shorten the crosswalk uh, up at that intersection of Pearl Street. So we are moving boldly ahead to uh, transition those yeah, so, they, so the <coughs> consultants that support us are supplemental to our staff. We feel that we have to have a, a solid base that is sustainable within our own team. And then when we need to do projects like this, we call in a consultant to supplement our, our resource to be able to push these through, get them done. So, okay. And I think actually it came to the finance board like last Monday, right? Okay. And then one last question. The, I've been hearing a lot about the, the union bike lane and the protection there. Um, you know, it got t pretty badly damaged. I remember just that. Yeah you know, seeing pieces of it on the sidewalk and on yep. green belts throughout the winter. How, I think it's one thing to get bike lanes and protected bike lanes in, but how do we better take care of these things so that we don't have that happen? Or how do we get it repaired when it is damaged? And then also, how is it, is it, how do we get these capital investments so, better? So we're better growing managed? our experience in terms of the systems that we use, the, the, the equipment, the technology to use to instruct and build these things. But also, our right-of-way team has to be prepared to be able to maintain these systems, and they need that support. They need growth within their team, within staff resource, to be able to do some of these things. So it's been a bit of a challenge from a number of perspectives. One is material selection that will work. I mean, it, it may be also some of the design that's really not been worked out completely because there's limited experience in the world. And the other piece is from a operational standpoint do we have people on staff prepared to do that and do we have the space to be able to do it and do it well and we've in the development of this budget I think we really kind of pushed hard to kind of find solutions to that but we're still I think struggling a little bit with getting where we want to be Nicole has been doing some research on other areas and what they've been doing in similar climates that cause these challenges Montreal as, a, as a resource um, you know so going to them and saying okay we tried this it failed you know what what are you using that's being successful and how could we transition to something else that might be more successful and when so. I went to the NACTO conference that was you know I was like I kind of scratched my head because a lot of people were presenting were from warmer climates and here I am little Burlington in a winter climate and I'm I'm speaking to this problem yeah. and I'm looking for someone to get a get a reaction out of them and and I had a lady from Nova Scotia who had same exact problems, same struggles, and I was like, you know, it's it's we're not alone. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand that it's totally an iterative process, and I appreciate you thinking through these yeah. the, these challenges and trying to, to 
to, to learn and, and adapt because it's it's a real challenge with the climate and those kinds of things so that and I think much. people just have to there's, it's a shift in culture and it's yeah. going to take time for people to kind of accept some of these systems and know that they're there and know what they mean and thank you um, just to uh, Councillor Tracy's uh, question on the sidewalks too I just want to um, you know, point out the way this process works as we finalize the budget between now and what actually comes to you in June for the vote um, uh, we have a, a discussion that still is going to uh, happen and, and the Board of Finance uh, you know, welcome input from all councillors on the use of the unassigned fund balance uh, I would like to, I'm I'm not thrilled that the first cut of this budget only has 2.3 million dollars and 2.3 miles of new sidewalks that is not as high as it's been the last couple of years where we've been closer to three miles so one possible uh, thing that's still coming is to bump that back up closer uh, to the three miles because you know, I hear the complaints too I mean I think part of it is people see all the sidewalk work going on around and they're like well when are you know want to make sure that we haven't forgotten about uh, you know, I've had a number of people say they, they put in a request five, three years ago. Uh, they're really looking forward to getting uh, getting on. So I think part of it's people see that work is happening and they want to get on the list. I am interested in trying to get it back up closer to three uh, for the for the fiscal year. So just one notion. I'd certainly that. support that, and I appreciate your ongoing consideration. Great. One other thing I just want to make sure is clear in this, and don't want it to be a surprise to anyone just because it has been an issue of some public interest, that we have a line in here for city public restrooms for $125,000, and that is the uh, that would reinstate the uh, city hall park uh, bathroom as uh, that, that had that we weren't sure how it would get funded. We're able to meet the other goals of the CIP budget um, uh, and get this back in. And so that's that's what I'm proposing at this point. President Ray. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Councillor uh, Busher was already. I cut her off a moment ago. So. Okay. So I, I just two quick questions that go along with what Councillor Tracy was talking about. I think that, um, you know, doing stretches of sidewalks were one thing, but it was more like save a square or replace a square. Um, and I, I really did now, I've, I've started to walk around and realize I almost kill myself. It just is one, one section of sidewalk that isn't done. And if you're somebody with a cane or a walker or someone that you know you could really injure yourself and so I think that's what the public is looking for too I mean yes people are looking for long spans of sidewalk work but I think a lot of people would be satisfied with um, an approach and the difficult one as you touched upon Norm of having squares around the city be replaced to make it more contiguous and to take the danger out of that sidewalk um, you know, we heard, you heard, and I heard for the first time, the woman who is in a motorized wheelchair not be able to navigate the sidewalk because of the unevenness and the problems, and so she's forced into the street. And so these are, these are real issues that we have to kind of come to terms with. Um, and we used to have that program. We abandoned it when we went to, got that consultant in who did all the, the work, but we we sort of we we, we still do. We yeah, didn't even abandon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. It, we still do. It it feels abandoned, but yeah. so maybe that's that's the problem. So, so what? It's not the reality, but the perception is it's it's not really mm -hmm. still there. Um, the other piece was with the quick builds that that you got in place. Um, before you make them permanent, do you evaluate if there's a visual barrier because? I can speak specifically to one in, in Ward 1 that I think is problematic, and hopefully you would reduce some of those visual barriers to make it safer. I understand the need to, to shorten the distance for pedestrians, but... but well, that's we the whole idea is we're, we're, yeah. we're giving it time to really settle in and identify does it work and work well before we formalize something with, with significant investment. So that's the idea of quick build itself. So, and so if you, does, if you find you there's back to how does that cycle back to the ward or the neighborhood before you make it permanent? What's that process? Well, we'd probably follow our civic engagement process. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So on the sidewalks last year, I'm on the accessibility committee, and last year our team 
we have many people in wheelchairs and they actually went around with their camera and they took photos in the downtown of areas that were a challenge to them and we actually addressed them. So we are trying to be responsive to that method is that, um, you know, if they go around and see an area, the diamond cutting of the sidewalk has also helped with that. Um, but we have been responding um, in that means of downtown is a challenge. So I'm not, in, I'm not even talking just about downtown because I think people yeah. forget that the yeah. medical center is a place where people have to yeah. access. Um, it's not a school, but it's a hospital. And so access to that and yeah. around that is important. So anyways, thank yeah, you. The, yeah, the method by which we assign work ties to things like, you know, is it near senior housing? Is it near a school? Is it high volume of pedestrian activity? That's where the, the significant investment's occurring as a first priority. But like I said, until you have kind of a, a good solid handle on the system and a sustainable system, you're, you're, you're going to spend high dollar and see if amount of capital to arrive at a place where we're just doing simple maintenance. Or in other words, we're doing little locations. So it, it, I think right now we're just trying to find the right balance between proactive work and reactive work to solve little problems. And what is that balance? It's never an exact science. So it's so we will adjust as we as we hear from the public. But and it also is a function sometimes of simply what do we have for money and staff and people and to make pull these things off. And if you can provide more money to these things and the public can be more receptive to our disruption, then we can we can do more. But it's there's a lot of backlog of stuff that just has not been addressed, and we're we're doing the best we can and. We will, we will adjust our sales as people provide comment, but it's not an easy thing to be satisfying all those needs because it's frankly, I don't think we've, we've come close to satisfying that need because of all the backlog. I agree, I agree. But I am looking for balance. Okay, she's Thank good, you. she's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I, I'm just, I'm gonna be real quick. I just wanna add my two cents to the same issue. Uh, I would support increasing that funding as you're talking about and prioritizing spending however we have to to put more into sidewalks. Um, it's, it is frustrating. I know you're doing the best you can. I've given streets that sometimes get worked on and sometimes they can't and it's frustrating. I have to tell people that who've waited for a long time that they're, they're not, yeah. not in the queue right away. Um, so I am very supportive of putting more money into that. Thank you. All right. Good, good, good stuff. Thank you. Um, and the last item of the night is uh, the capital capital plan from Parks. Welcome back, Cindy. Thank you. Yep. Those slides to get loaded. Well, Cindy's getting ready. I mean, just, I, I think the way to, I mean, maybe some other people have a different thought in their mind, but like, to me, the, the problem we're battling with the sidewalks is we, you know, from the best that I think we are aware of for a long, we have about 100, more than 120 miles of sidewalks, right? And we were placing about a mile a year. So, you know, for a long time, I don't know how, we must have been doing more than that at some point, but about a mile a year which you know that that means you know you, and we all know a sidewalk's not going to last for 100 and 130 years but that's how long it's going to take to get through the replacement cycle now we're if we're up to three miles a year you're actually back if you were able to sustain that for a 40-year period you'd be in pretty good shape because you might most of those sidewalks should last between 30 and 40 years um and you would should be back on it three miles is at least arguably a sort of sustainable um uh uh, system but you know it's gonna be a long time it, it, it's it's decades before you've fully probably addressed the neglect um, uh, with so you know unless we're talking and, and I just I don't see us I think we should I think we will come to you with a sustainable way to keep up that three miles a year I think the the debt level projections we showed gave us at least a, a, something to shoot for there but I don't see an easy, immediate way out of the the kind of the sidewalk 
um, challenge that built up over a long time, I think. But I, you know, so, if if other people think there's something different about that analysis, uh, I would welcome it. But that's the way I think we, our team is seeing it. Um, Cindy. Great. All right, so we're going to jump right in. Um, we'll start with Penny for Parks. Um, if you're familiar with the amount of money, we, we normally are budgeting for that. Um, it's much higher this year. We normally bring in around 370 and change um, uh, 1,000 per year. We had a little bit of backlog, which is allowing us to do the Letty Tennis Court renovation. That's a, a big ticket item. And again, having that savings is allowing us to do that. It is the home of Burlington High School and their tennis program. And we've been going around the city renovating the tennis courts and we determined that was the next one um, that had the priority. Uh, continuing the work with Arms Forest, doing some work down at Perkins Pier. Uh, System-wide, we're always doing playground improvements there, um, hoping to kind of catch up a little bit uh, more specifically around our playgrounds and some compliance with them. Uh, we started budgeting this year and I believe over the next two years is uh, restroom renovations. Um, we did do the upper uh, bathrooms at Oak Ledge and so uh, this year would potentially be the lower bathrooms at Oak Ledge but we also still have Callahan Park and we've got the bathrooms down at Perkins Pier so we have a number of uh, flush bathrooms that we need to um, start looking at and bringing them up um, to standard. Um, doing some work at Chifletti Park. Um, hopefully we can get to some improvements at North Beach Campground. And then the last two, the emergent needs and the community requests. The emergent needs are sometimes things come up, we're not budgeted for them, but they pop up as a capital need that we need to deal with. So we try to make sure we've kept some money in there for that. And then the community requests, and that's one I touched on in our, was the people section of our general fund budget. We're really trying to work on doing more outreach um, with our planning team. And if you've been to any of our um, either our Letty or our Arms Forest, you'll see kind of a new style of outreach that we're doing as far as our public meetings that we've been getting really good feedback on. But then also going straight out to the community. I was at the Wards 2 and 3 NPA talking about Penny for Parks. And then we were um, did a program with the Family Room, um, also at the Old North End. So that was something that, um, helping to get more of the word out on Penny for Parks. Impact fees, um, so we have about 153000 this year on that. Some of it's a little money uh, me moving forward from 19. Continuing the work at Arms Forest that we're doing now. We have South Champlain Park reconstruction in there. One of the things that we're finishing up, and then when the um, grounds manager comes on, hopefully they'll be able to wrap that project up, is we've been looking at all of our playgrounds and kind of ranking them in the need to replace. Right now we're planning on focusing on South Champlain, but as that project finishes up, that may be a shift depending on uh, which playgrounds need um, the attention the most. Um, a little bit of work on the court, the Callahan Park court lights renovation. That's not a really big ticket item, so we just have some safety pieces there that we need to get to. Um, the Schmanska Park walkway, um, right now it's that's the main sort of, almost like you think of it as a road that goes up into the park. It's all gravel and it's just washing out into the street, so we're going to get that paved. And then some money towards um, bike racks. And I know um, this summer we'll be finishing off that bike park or bike rack inventory, so that'll help us be clear about where to um, where to put those racks. Um, the question was about um, Greenbelt. So this is where we have our, um, a lot of money that we're putting towards the Emerald Ash Bore. And we are using um, some use of fund balance in there too to help to make that even more robust. Uh, again, as the mayor noted, you've probably read in the press release, is that VJ's been using a new system for um, the trees. Um, so that's allowed us to plant more trees um, with that additional funds that we're doing. Next one is the Open Space Conservation Legacy Fund. A reminder with that one is that um, only 30% of that money that comes in every year can be spent on administrative costs. So a portion of that goes to Dan Cahill's um, salary, um, but then we're also saving money um, as projects come up. So that that fund is one where it's okay if it just continues to grow be in, because it might mean we don't have a project right then to either be buying land or doing an easement. Um, this past, gosh, within the past two years, we had a really big hit on that on that uh, fund, which was really good because we had some really outstanding uh, legacy projects that came up. But now we're at a point now where we're starting to rebuild that a little bit. So more of the highlights there is thinking about the staff time and what the staff is doing um, with their with their time. Next one is bike path maintenance. Um, that one there is again that's uh, Paul. Um, is paid out of that fund and his job is to make sure our bike path is in really good shape. He does um, the maintenance with the seasonal team and then also the trails in the city. Uh, he's, again, the winter support for cross-country skiing in the interval was something that we were uh, new this year that we did <coughs> at a lot of use. If anybody had gone down there and gone skiing, it was really pretty fabulous. That's, we do that's the half penny? Mm-hmm, correct. Yeah. It's the half penny. 
Yeah, it used it's, to be only 180. So, yeah, so. well, it is a small amount, but that's we've got some capital equipment purchases we're doing, so we've got a little bit of money that's grown in there, so a little bit of use of fund balance, and so a dump trailer just to help them do the work that they need to do. They um, worked with the DPW Fleet Division on that one, um, and we did a test last year with Local Motion. We um, you can take their bikes for a week, and so we took one of their e-bikes and they had a trailer for us to, to see if we could again try to use reduce the gas emissions, so we don't have the Kubota up and down the um, path as much. Um, and it was great being able to test it, almost like a quick build of parks compared to DPW quick build. Um, we were trying this out, and so looking instead of a, uh, a bike with their trailer, they're looking at more of a trike model that has a flatbed and back that they can, they found that would be more maneuverable. Um, so once, um, if budgets all go through, that'll be something they'll be looking to purchase. And again, just trying to get some of our vehicles off the bike path, and our team was really supportive of giving this a shot, and they said it was fun. Uh, last one is our special projects. This is the money that um, comes out of the, the um, larger, it's our we call it park special projects, and a lot of that's our capital funding from our city. And so that's our big one. We obviously don't have $4 million in our penny for parks. Um, so that's what helps fund the work that we're doing on the Greenway. Um, again, the replacement of the Letty Maintenance Facility, which as a note, um, just to make sure you're, you realize too, the Letty Maintenance Facilities, who will be taking down the barn at North Beach as part of that project, which helps us move forward to the campground renovation that we've been wanting to do. So just a little bit, some of those are carryover from FY19. Um, is a slight aside, but I remember a friend of mine when I was in, um, in Rutland where I had basically zero capital dollars unless there was a bond that went out. And he was lamenting about how the mayor called him up and told him, you need to spend $6 million by the end of the year. And I was like, oh, well, how lucky can you be? And I for now realize how hard it is to spend money. It's not easy, capital projects, there's planning, you gotta go to bid, and and anyway. So now I understand how expensive, how far, much work it is to spend money. So some of our projects we, we hope to get done that year, but every now and then they do have to carry over to the next year. And the last one is donations. Um, this would be donations or, um, and or grants different things that we're doing so pause places on the greenway again that was funded by the work that the parks foundation had done um cameron rise um, to the greenway hopefully we'll get that done this year that we're working in close concert with um, eric farrell on that project um, because where our path goes is also where his stormwater goes so we're going to be working in concert and he's not quite ready to get started on that yet and then the last one there is oak ledge universal playground um, that was a large grant that we've gone out for and we have not heard word yet if we've received it and that's really our perks projects. If anybody has any questions about what so you're we're better doing. off having less money then. No, that's not true. <laughs> no, not true. But I just realized it was like one of those ones like it was like, wow, it does actually I can use it. We'll no, 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 no. We're spending it. But just some years you don't quite get everything done. But the nice part is is it stays in our budget because it's capital. And and then some years you can get Letty tennis courts done because maybe you weren't able to spend all that money, but then you can get those large Letty tennis courts done. We want the Letty tennis courts done. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because it's in your ward. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's her then so, Tracy. The Schmanska Barn, where does that project sit? That's a good question. I need to check in to see where um, we had count, former Councilor Dean was helping us with that one, and I know that it's on the um, list for FY20 for our parks team is to um, put together all the costs to try to get that building back up and going again. We actually have some requirements to do it. I did a, a search on the history of Land Water Conservation Fund and where monies had gone in Burlington over the years. I can't remember why I had gone down that rabbit hole, but I noticed that we had received money in 1996 from the Land Water Conservation Fund. Thank me. you, was that you? It was me, and working with Bob Whalen. And, and so oh, that's great. to get that barn originally restored and used, and then I really don't know why it all fell apart because and, and so yeah. you don't have to give me that history. Yeah. And but I, I'm very yeah. frustrated because we used to have our neighborhood planning assembly meetings there in the summer, and it's it's a really wonderful space. And now, you know, it's like taboo, and I don't understand why. Yes. And so yeah. I was hoping that I would see that in this capital presentation, but it was silent. Yeah, it, there's no specific link because we still need to figure out what all the costs are to bring it up. But it's one where we need to, and again, the it's on the plan FY20 plan for the parks team to work on that. Um, it's a challenge. I mean, we're constantly balancing, you know, different needs. And so, like, I know this, that we've talked to the um, neighborhood, and so if I have a playground that's falling apart, and I have eighty thousand dollars to spend. 
It's hard for me to justify, justify spending that $80,000 to bring that barn up to a standard than to replace a neighborhood playground that's falling apart. So those are some of the things we're balancing. And I'm not saying that the barn doesn't have value, but that's some of the various challenges that so what we need is to know what is that bottom line what is that cost for us to do it because we're we're going to um we've got the distance from the hydrant as far as the fire station do we need to put in the um sprinkler system or not put in the sprinkler system so there's different ones that we're um working on and right now frankly we're trying to get a marina open so um right it's this moment now in time is one where we can't deviate off what our path is at the time for um, getting all our parks up and running. I think Earhart, Monka, and I would have worked really hard with uh, Ireland, yeah. who gave us a lot of money to do some upgrades for the park, To I mean, if we had known that the barn was the si in the situation it was yeah. in. So anyways. Cindy, um, I think the bottom line is that we put that money into the Letty tennis court. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> this person uh, to, my, to my left here anyway um, I, I am interested and I will probably pursue yeah, that and I, I, if, and I don't mind I you pursuing that I thought it should at, at least be a line item with no funding at least so it's not forgotten I guess that's my point Mr. Mayor I'm concerned about it not being silent you well know? that could be one of the projects that falls in the emergent needs you know we have money set aside I blink it's thousand dollars that's in emergent needs and that could be potentially one of those emergent I, needs I'm, I'm not I'm I'm not categorizing it as an emergent need but I am categorizing it as a need and I want it as a placeholder so that it doesn't get forgotten that's yep, I hear you yep thank you thank you Councilor Tracy uh, so this kind of goes along with the sidewalks okay, conversation because okay. you all oh, help sorry. manage our green belts mm -hmm. um, one of the other issues not only in terms of like the actual condition of the sidewalk that we hear about okay. is also the flooding of the sidewalks and a lot of times what we see is like a mounding happening in the green belt where over it'll build up oh, and okay. I had done like a, a project with the constituent a while ago to actually yeah. shave that down and parks was very helpful okay. um, in doing that this was several years ago but yeah. I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity to collaborate with DPW around the green belts and, and helping with drainage issues because I think that that can also create accessibility issues when it comes to our sidewalks especially in the winter when we have a, a sidewalk that's flooded and ice and then there and then becomes ice and we've done some of that in the past yeah. the problem is you have to avoid damaging trees and tree root systems and so it's the, you know when we have a sidewalk we can sometimes elevate the sidewalk to address that problem because you can't you can't impact the tree but that that mounding occurs because you're wind growing in the middle of winter all this debris and material that's on the roadway itself so um, we could probably could do more of that and we probably should have more conversations about that but it's been done in the past but only in a very limited way for those reasons okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is a um, lot of seen a lot of great improvements in Roosevelt over the last couple of years okay. also heard some good things about the new basketball hoops in Pomeroy yeah. I'm wondering if there's anything else you're thinking about for Pomeroy for this year um, not, no specific improvements that we have. Um, I'm not sure, but I don't think the courts are in the near future. I don't, if we're getting, or were they, oh, they were going to get resurfaced. Right now, so. I know, and I almost, were they going to resurface those when they were doing apple tree? I, and I, they repainted them. Did they just repaint them? Yeah. Okay, then so they did that as part of that too. Yeah, so not for this year, but we'll look back again. And I guess if there's something that you have in mind, just. Yeah, we got to revisit the hedge conversation. We definitely need to revisit the hedge conversation. The hedge yeah. conversation because there's a lot of issues with dogs yeah. and using that as a dog run in the back there. Yeah, and it definitely seems like there's not neighborhood consensus on that, just in the little bit that we've done. So, yeah, let's you and I connect on that. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I just want to, uh, Cindy mentioned um, going to the Ward 23 MPA. Uh, I, um, I know there's, we're in a period where MPAs are looking to get more engaged and, and have, you know, there's a request for additional funding and, and the draft budget does have additional funding in it for the MPAs. Um, but um, I, I think another thing to encourage MPAs to engage in is the Penny for Parks budget. There's definitely a significant chunk of the, the Penny for Parks budget that is reserved for the needs that we hear from the community. Um, and. Uh, I think that'd be a, that's a real opportunity for that kind of community-based uh, budgeting to 
uh, to have an impact on what actually gets spent and invested. So um, when you do hear that from your constituents, uh, uh, you can help us amplify that message and encourage people to engage that. I think more T3 MPA is is doing that, right? I think they are uh, weighing in, but I don't know that we the others are as active on uh, on this issue. So. On that note, are we, uh, everyone good? No, oh, President Wright? I, I am. I just want to, before we wrap it up, I just want to say um, happy St. Patrick's Day to Chapin Spencer. <laughs> 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 so I took my green coat off. <laughs>